Let me give you three steps to start life change that can change. Well, your life, your personality, your lifestyle, everything change. Here's the steps. Number one, find out how things work. The first key to doing better is find out to change your life. It's really, you need ideas. If there is anything an idea can't change. And uh, Shoff taught me the major problem is the lack of an idea, not a problem. At first, I didn't have any money. I said to Mr. Shoff, I don't have any money. He said, that's not a problem. Now see, up until then, I always thought it was right. I was confused. He said, no, no. The problem is lack of an idea on how to create money and wealth. It isn't lack of money, it's lack of ideas. So if you get the ideas, so you can change anything. Now to get ideas, you need a constant study of finding out. Now Shof also said, when you find out something that works, put the information in your journal. Don't use your head for a filing cabinet. Put it in your journal so that you can do the next best thing. Repetition, 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 go over it, and if you repeat it, go over it. Sure enough, someday some mysterious day. The idea takes root, starts to grow, and shows up in your bank account, and your dress, and your personality, and your lifestyle. But capture the ideas in your journal. Find out how things work. Uh, Shof gave me this word for my life change, he said. Study great word. If you wish to be successful, study success. If you wish to be happy, study happiness. If you wish to be wealthy, study wealth. Don't leave it to chance. Uh, make it a study. Uh, some people just go through the day with their fingers crossed. See, that won't do it. You've got to study the things that can change your economic, social, spiritual, personal life. You know, here's a qualifying phrase, and we'll have several of these qualifying phrases throughout the seminar. Here's the first one. You may not be able to do all you find out. I understand that you may not be able to do all you find out, but you should find out all you can do. So you don't want to wind up at the end of your life and discover that you've lived only one tenth of it and the other nine tenths went down the drain, not for lack of opportunity, for lack of information. So that's number one, find out how things work. Now here's the best human virtue for finding out, curiosity. Make a note of that curiosity, be curious. You might add a word to it, that'll help. Childish curiosity. What will kids do if they want to know something bad enough bug you? That's the phrase. They can ask 1,000 questions. You think they're through. They've got another 1,000. They'll drive you to the brink. It's a virtue when you've got to know be like a child. In fact, Jesus, the master teacher, said, unless you can become like little children, you might as well forget it. You don't have a prayer. Excellent advice. You've got to be like children four ways, in my opinion, to be like a child. So, uh, number one is curiosity, and two is excitement. Get excited like a child over your ability to make yourself do anything for change. Third is faith. Have faith like a child. Adults are too skeptical. And fourth is trust. Trust is a childish virtue, but the rewards are incredible. So be like a child. Now, if you're curious, let me give you three ways to find out how to change anything, any life direction, any dimension. Here's three ways to find out how to change anything. Now, number one is to read, become a good reader. All of the successful people I know and work with around the world, they're all good readers. Curiosity drives them to read. They got to know, they just read, 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 become a good reader. Now that's my opinion. Listen to the other lectures and listen to me and make up your own mind. Don't be a follower, be a student. Okay, I say really for life change, you gotta read. One way to learn is from your own experiences, but another way to learn is from other people's experiences. And see, one book might save you five years if you read it. Uh, did you know there's books on how to be stronger, more decisive, be a speaker, be a leader, have a better effect on other people, develop your personality? Did you know there's books on that and people don't read them? Uh, how would you explain that? And they can read. Did you know that hundreds of successful people have written their stories in books and they wrote down how they did it and people don't read it? How would you explain that? The guy's busy. I guess, you know, you get tied up, the guy says, well, yeah, you work where I work. By the time you struggle home, it's late. You got to eat a bite of supper, watch a little TV, get to bed. You can't sit up half the night reading, reading, reading. And the guy's behind on his car payment. Good worker, hard worker, sincere. But you got to be better than sincere and work hard. Otherwise, at the end of your life, you'll wind up cold. Sony broke, you got to be better than a good worker. You got to be a good reader. 
Uh, get around successful people and listen. Now you can also learn from unsuccessful people. Take notes on both negative and positive. On the negative, the notes are called what not to do. And you got to learn what not to do as well as what to do. So learn from the negative as well as the positive, okay? Find out what poor people read and don't read it right. That's good information. Learn from the negative. Uh, but now you can also learn from the positive. Get, get around successful people. Listen to what they say. Listen to how they say it. It's important. We've all got about 16 waking hours. Practice listening those 16 hours. And I say practice listening because listening isn't easy. I found out it's easier to talk than it is to listen. But if you will practice listening the 16 hours, you're awake. Sure enough, from surprising sources comes great ideas. In sales training, we teach. Uh, if you want to learn sales, listen to the kids. Kids have got to be the master salespeople of all time. They have no equal, the father tells his young son. No, you cannot have an ice cream cone. 30 minutes later, he's licking on one. That'd be 30 minutes worth listening to. They got moves you wouldn't believe. Persistence runs deep like the ocean. And the kids never took a class on how to overcome objections. They already know how. They don't need classes, so listen and learn. Now here's some of the best advice I've got for the whole evening. It won't get any better than this. This is it. Our people ought to take rich people out to dinner and listen. That's some of the best I got. If a guy's not doing well, one of the first things he ought to do is find a guy that is doing well and offer to buy him his dinner. Hey, Andy, $100 go for the full nine, of course. Start him on the juices and whores do Get him started talking. Salad takes 15 minutes. Keep it rolling. Biggest steak in town takes 45. Keep it rolling. Pour on the dessert. Stretch that meal out about two hours. If you get a successful person to eat and talk for two hours, they're liable to drop ideas in your lap. Change your life. Multiply your income by two by three by five. But you're right, poor people don't usually take rich people out to dinner. That's the problem. The guy said he's rich. Let him buy his own dinner. I'm not coming up with any money. And he says, besides you work where I work. By the time you struggle home, it's late. Uh, you're lucky to get your own supper, let alone run around trying to find a rich man to feed. And the guy's behind on his house payment. Good worker, hard worker, sincere. But you gotta be better than sincere. Work hard, you wind up broke. You gotta be better than a good worker. You gotta be a good listener and remember what you read and what you hear. Put the good stuff in your journal. Now here's the third way to find out how to change your life, and that's to observe. You can pick up a lot of ideas just by watching. Get around successful people and watch. Here by success leaves clues. Watch how the man shakes hands. Watch how the lady responds. People who do well do certain things over and over and over and over. And if you're clever, you can pick them up. Watch it all. If a guy's making $10,000 a month, I'd watch how he walks. Hey, that's it. Copy his funny little walk, somebody says. Well, that's kind of a silly walk. Say it's 10,000. I haven't got the money yet, but I got the walk. It's bound to start somewhere. What I ask you tonight is to be unusual and be a good observer of what's going on. You can pick up ideas that can change your life. Starting tomorrow, just be a more careful observer. Now remember, there's two ways to see. One is called sights, see with your eyes. The other one is called insight, see with your mind, see with your eyes. You'll see things, see with your mind, you'll see answers. Put your eyes and your mind to work. And the best advice on developing sight and insight is pay attention. Don't miss anything. In the weekend seminar we teach, one of the greatest fatalities to success is preoccupation. Lack of concentration, the, the guy's mind wanders. So you wind up average, you've got to learn to zero in and concentrate. I read a good article one time, Reader's Digest. The title was wherever you are, be there. Excellent. Don't miss anything now. We've lingered a little bit long on one here for personal development. Find out how things work. But it's so very important finding out. And I've given you three ways to find out. Now here's the second step to personal development. Okay, number one was find out how things work. Here two, go to work. You must now take action on what you found out in doing business around the world. We call it game plan. Put together your game plan. One of the major things we teach on the, on the weekend seminars. Game plans, how to game plan your office. If you're in sales, you need a game plan. Kids need a game plan. You need a home game plan, social game plan, business game plan. Everybody needs game plans, financial independence. 
game plan, your investment game plan. Don't think in your head. Put it on paper. Don't operate out of your mind. O operate from paper. I often ask somebody, what are you going to do the next six months? And somebody starts to tell me, I say, no, don't tell me, show me, show me your game plan for the next six months. Then I can look at things and maybe I can help. But you got to operate from paper, put it on a game plan, take action on what you found out. Now, here's the best word I know of to go with action. Massive. So I see that'll change everything. Massive action is called the cure-all. If you're going to make calls, make a few thousand. If you're going to make contacts, make a few thousand. If you're going to knock on doors, knock on a few thousand. See, that'll change everything. Here's the language of the poor. I'll try it a time or two and see what happens. It's the way poor people talk. The guy says, well, I'll give it 30 days. 30 days. You could guess his bank balance. You've got to have a better game plan. So oh, here's one of the major things to do. Starting tomorrow, take a look at your game plan. If it isn't loaded with massive action, change it tomorrow. The formula really works like this. Pick up a good idea. Take heavy action, pick up a couple of good ideas. Take heavy action. That's the formula for sex, success, heavy action. It's a good thing we can edit all this, right? The uh, formula for success, take heavy action on a good idea. That's the ratio. Now here's the key. Don't wait till you've learned two or 3,000 things because that way you'll use up all the time. And you could wind up smart and broke. And hey, that's how it could be dumb and broke. But if a guy's smart and broke, that's pitiful. Don't let your learning lead to knowledge. You become a fool, let your learning lead to action. Uh, you can become wealthy, and there's many kinds of wealth. I understand that not just money. Money is one of the least of all values. I know some people with a lot of money that are very poor, Vita Singhs. As for fortune and as for fame, they are illusions. They're not the solutions they promise to be. So oh, there's all kinds of wealth. If to get a big share coming your way, you've got to have a heavy action game plan. Now here's the third step to personal development. And we'll wrap up personal development step three. It's just a little caution and all through life we need little cautions. This one simply says, don't try to beat the system. Find out how it works, work it, but don't try to beat it. Uh, some people learn just enough to start slicing it, shading it, thinning it, cutting corners, and looking for cheap answers. So you don't fall for that, you wind up with a cheap life. Find out how it works best and do it that way. Even though it seems to take a little longer, do it right. Don't compromise with right now under this step. Here's another key, be a quick learner. Don't let it take long to teach you. Learn quick, don't run at the wall too many times. Learn quicker. One guy said he broke his nose seven times in the same place. Somebody says, looks like you'd stay out of that place. Learn quicker now. The third point here is uh, don't be stubborn. See, some people won't change even when a better way comes. They say, well, I've been doing it this way 30 years. Hey, be ready for change. If it's a better way, go for it. But don't try to beat it or you'll be like the guy that went to Las Vegas. He didn't have much money, so he didn't want to risk his money gambling. But he gets to Las Vegas and the jackpot bells are ringing. The money's flowing, the lights are flashing, and he can't help himself. He's got the gamble, but instead of gambling with his cash, he decides to play the mental gambling game. And the brilliant scheme he worked out goes like this. He'd pick a number like three mentally. He would bet a certain amount of money on the number, and whether it won or lost, he would jot down that amount in his little pad. I would have won five dollars if I'd made that, that just to keep track of it, win or lose. That way, come midnight, he can calculate how he's doing, win or lose or how much, only not his money. Keep his money. Just play this mental gambling game. So here he is around the gambling table, everybody else shelling out their hard-earned cash. He's got this brilliant scheme. Instead of betting with his money, he's betting with his mind. And he lost his mind, which means don't try to beat the system, I guess. Now, jot down these five key ideas. Here's number one, work on your personal philosophy. The first thing you start changing is what? Your philosophy. 
You start changing your mind. You start changing how you think. You start picking up new ideas and information. Gather new knowledge. Make better decisions about what's valuable. And I'm telling you, if you do that, your whole life will change. Your health will change. Your relationship with your family will change. Your ability to cope with challenges and problems will change. I'm telling you, income, promotions, all of it will change. If you will change, it'll all change. If you won't change, it isn't going to change. You can keep your fingers crossed if you want to and hope they'll straighten it out. You can wish for the wind not to blow quite as severe, but I'm telling you, wishing for the wind to change in your favor, I mean, we call naive at best. Don't do this any longer. Wish for a better wind. The key is to wish for the wisdom to set a better sail. Utilize whatever wind that blows to take you wherever you want to go. That is the philosophy I picked up at age 25 and it revolutionized my whole life. My mentor said, Mr. Owen, you've been working six years. How are you doing? I said, not very well. He said, I suggest you not do that anymore. He said, couldn't we go over the last six years and find out where your errors in judgment were? And couldn't we correct those and invest that correction in the next six years? I said, I guess we could. That's how I went from pennies to four. Incredible. Only humans can do this. See, if you were a tree, you'd be stuck. <laughs> right? If you used up all the nourishment around you, couldn't move, then you would die. But that's not true. So, however little what much you want to change, that's up to you. But see, if there's a class and you don't take it, and a skill and you don't learn it, and a discipline and you don't try it, and if there's a possibility and you don't explore it, then who are we going to blame? Nobody but yourself. You know, we put some of the valuable things on the high shelf, so you can't get to them until you qualify. If you want the things on the higher shelf, you've got to stand on the book you read. Every book you read, you get to stand a little higher so you can get the things on a higher shelf. Become a good reader. All of the successful people I know and work with around the world, they're all good readers. Curiosity drives them to read. They gotta know. They just read, 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 read. Did you know there's books on how to be stronger? More decisive. Be a speaker. Be a leader. Have a better effect on other people. Develop your personality. Did you know there's books on that? And people don't read them? How would you explain that? And they can read? Did you know that hundreds of successful people have written their stories in books and they wrote down how they did it and people don't read it? How would you explain that? The guy's busy, I guess. You know, you get tied up. The guy says, well, yeah, you work where I work. By the time you struggle home, it's late. You've got to eat a bite of supper, watch a little TV, get to bed. You can't sit up half the night reading, 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 reading. And the guy's behind on his car payment. Good worker, hard worker, sincere. But you got to be better than sincere and work hard. Otherwise, at the end of your life, you'll wind up cold, stony broke. You got to be better than a good worker. You got to be a good reader. Now, you don't have to read or listen to educational cassettes half the night. Although if you're broke, it's a good place to start. But here is all I ask, just 30 minutes a day. That's all. Stretch it to an hour if you can, but at least 30 minutes. Hear or read something challenging, something instructional, at least 30 minutes a day. And here's the next key. Every day, don't miss. Miss a meal, but not your 30 minutes. Hey, you can get along without some meals, but you can't get along without some ideas, examples, and inspiration. And also remember to properly feed the mind, you must have good balance. Don't just read or listen to the easy stuff. You can't live on mental candy. Mr. Shelf got me started on my library when I first met him. He said to me, become self-educated. Standard education will get you standard results. Check those numbers and see if that's what you want. And if it isn't, 
If you want something better than standard, you must become self-educated. Chope recommended a couple of books in particular to get me started. Now I had a Bible, that's 66 books, so that was a pretty good start. But the first book Mr. Shove told me to get was the book Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. If you don't already have it, it's a great one to add to your library. I read it several dozen times. Shove said repetition is the mother of skill. And if you could have seen my bank account at the time, you would have known I needed lots of that kind of repetition. Some of the ideas in that book made major changes in my life. As I look back now, the book was worth thousands, and I bought it for pennies. I learned a very valuable lesson. There can be a great deal of difference between cost and value. Before I met Mr. Shope, I used to ask, how much does it cost? After I met him, however, I soon learned to ask, how much is it worth? I started basing my life on worth instead of cost, and everything changed. Here's the next one, attitude. Attitude. It is our attitude toward life which will determine life's attitude toward us. Now let's talk about the attitudes of people who are successful. Successful people come in all shapes and sizes and in widely varying degrees of intelligence, background, and so on. But they all have one thing in common. They expect more good out of life than bad. They expect to succeed more than they fail. If you want something worthwhile, take the attitude that there are a lot more reasons why you can have it than there are that you cannot, and set out to earn it. Go after it, work at it, ask for it, and nine times out of ten, you'll get it. Now, let me tell you a little test you can make which will prove beyond any shadow of a doubt that a good attitude can change a person's life as dramatically as walking from a darkened room into the bright, clear light of day. So here's the test. For the next 30 days, act toward the world, everything and everyone with whom you come in contact, with the attitude which represents the kind of results you want to achieve. That is, if the result you want is more success in what you're doing, Act as though you are already in possession of the success you seek. If you want others to treat you with admiration and respect, treat others with admiration and respect first. Have you ever stopped to think of this? Every human being on earth is the most important human being on earth as far as he or she is concerned. You may never get anyone to admit it, but it's a fact. So for the next 30 days, treat every person with whom you come in contact as the most important person on earth, remembering as you do so that as far as that person is concerned, he is. Now the reason I say treat everyone in this fashion is mainly because this is the way human beings ought to treat each other and because it will help you form a habit that will bring you amazing and delightful results for the rest of your life. Have you ever noticed that the higher you go in any organization of value, the nicer the people seem to become? You see, the bigger the person, the easier it is to talk to him, to get along with him, to do business with him. Do you know why? It's because he's got a good attitude, and people with the best attitudes just naturally gravitate toward the top. So for 30 days, act toward others in the world at large in exactly the same manner you want the world and others to act toward you. Treat your wife or husband as the person he or she really is, the most important person in your life. The same with the children. Carry out into the world each morning for 30 days the kind of attitude you would have if you were the most successful human being on earth. And notice how it quickly develops into an habitual attitude. When a person does this, he should realize he has already placed himself on the road to what he seeks. He is right now in the top 5% of the people in this or any other country. He has prepared the ground and planted the seed. He has made of himself a magnet, an embodiment of that which he seeks. Before metal can be cast into a desired shape, the mold, the expectant receptacle, must first be fashioned. Before a building can be erected, the excavation must be made and the foundation laid. And before a person can achieve the kind of life he wants, 
He must become that kind of individual. He must think, act, talk, walk, and conduct himself in all of his affairs as would the person he wishes to become. He is then actually that person, and the things that person would have and do will naturally come to him. Almost immediately a change will be noticed. Irritations that used to frustrate and annoy disappear. When some less informed individual gives you a bad time, stay on the track. When someone cuts in front of you with his car or acts in any other manner that shows his ignorance and lack of courtesy, don't permit yourself to drop to his level. Pity him, for that's what he really deserves. That's the very group a person doesn't want to belong to. And if he acts like them, well, let's face it, he belongs with them. There's nothing in the world that men, women, and children want and need more than the feeling that they're important, that they're needed and respected. They will give their love, their affection, their respect, and their business to the person who fills this need. So the magic word is attitude. And in summing up, a few points to keep in mind. One, it is our attitude at the beginning of a task which more than anything else will affect its successful outcome. Two, it is our attitude toward life which determines life's attitude toward us. Three, we are interdependent. It is impossible to succeed without others. And it is our attitude toward others which will determine their attitude toward us. Four, before a person can achieve the kind of life he wants, he must become that kind of individual. He must think, act, talk, walk, and conduct himself in all of his affairs as would the person he wishes to become. Five, the higher you go in any organization of value, the better will be the attitude you'll find. Six, your mind can hold only one thought at a time, and since there's nothing at all to be gained by being negative, be positive. Seven, the deepest craving of human beings is to be needed, to feel important, to be appreciated. Give it to them and they'll return it to you. Eight, look for the best in new ideas. As someone said, I've never met a person I couldn't learn something from. Nine, don't waste valuable time broadcasting personal problems. It probably won't help you. It cannot help others. 10, don't talk about your health unless it's good. 11, radiate the attitude of well-being, of confidence of a person who knows where he's going. This will inspire those around you, and you'll find good things will begin happening to you. And 12, lastly, for the next 30 days, treat everyone with whom you come in contact as the most important person on earth. If you'll do this for 30 days, you'll do it for the rest of your life. Now here's the third of the five ideas, number three, and it's called lifestyle. Because the essence of life is not a Ferrari or a bank account, it's not a million dollars. Here's the essence of life. Learning to live a good life. Don't just learn how to earn. Learn how to live. Mr. Shelf taught me lifestyle in those early days, starting with small amounts. He said, imagine that you're getting your shoes shined. And the shoe shine boy has done a fabulous job. So you pay him for the shine. Now you consider from the change in your hand what kind of tip to give him. And the question pops into your mind, shall I give him one quarter or two quarters for my neat shine? Mr. Shelf said, if two amounts for a tip ever come to your mind, always go for the higher amount. I said, what difference would that make? One quarter or two quarters? He said, all the difference in the world. If you said, well, I'll just give him one quarter, that will affect you for the rest of the day. You will start feeling bad. Sure enough, in the middle of the day, you will look down at your great shoe shine and say, I've got to be cheap. One lousy quarter. That will affect you. However, if you go for two quarters, Shelf said, you can't believe the feeling you can buy for another quarter. That's lifestyle. So develop your lifestyle a little more. Your style of seeing, giving, sharing, enjoying. It's not the amount that counts, but the experience of choosing to live with style. 
I remember saying to Mr. Schof one time, if I had more money, I would be happy. And he gave me some of the better words of wisdom when he said to me, Mr. Rohn, the key to happiness is not more. Happiness is an art to be studied and practiced. He said, more money will only make you more of what you already are. If you're inclined to be unhappy, if you get a lot of money, you will be miserable. More money will only make you more. More money will only amplify. If you are inclined to be mean and you get a lot of money, you will be a terror. If you are inclined to drink a little too much, when you get a lot of money, you can now become a drunk because you can drink everything. So style is not more. Style is an art. Here's something else to think about. Did you ever hear where the expression tip came from? As in tipping the waiter or waitress in a restaurant. Mr. Schoff taught me that it began as a symbol for the phrase to ensure promptness. Now Schoff said, if a tip is to ensure promptness, when should you give it? Answer, up front. See, I didn't know that. I said, no, you have lunch, and if you get good service, you leave a good tip. If you get lousy service, no tip. And he said to me, no, no, Mr. Roan. Sophisticated people don't take a chance on good service. They ensure good service by giving the money up front. I said, wow, what a way to live. I had never thought of that. So the next time you have someone special to take to lunch, call the waitress over, arm around the shoulders and say, here's five dollars. Would you take good care of me and my friend? Schultz said you won't believe what happens. They do what's known as hover. They hover around your table. Same money, different style. The next one is activity. Now, here's an important question. What is your philosophy about activity? What about hard work? What about long hours? What about full days? If you're doing something, how hard should you go at it? How much time should you put in? Everybody has to develop their philosophy about activity. Because your philosophy of activity will affect the rest of your life. Not to think so is naive. I've got a good clue on rest. Make rest a necessity, not an objective. If you rest too long, the weeds take the garden in the summer. So you can't rest too long. Life doesn't stand still. And the threat of life will start overwhelming the values of life if you just let it go. So we've all got to have a philosophy about activity. Let me give you one of the best I know. Here's what it says. An ancient phrase says, Whatever your hands find to do, do it with all your might. That's a philosophy. You say, well, I'm getting by with half my might. Well, okay, but you've got to decide on your own personal philosophy of activity. Now, this philosophy says, do it with all your might. Do you think there's any value or virtue in that? Well, I don't know. You've got to decide. You've got to weigh this out. Right? You've got to evaluate it for yourself and put it on your own mental scales and you've got to come up with your own answers. How hard should you work? I'm teaching kids now the ant philosophy. The ant philosophy. An ancient story says everybody should study ants, especially lazy people. The ant philosophy. Let me give it to you. It's very brief. Number one, ants never quit. Good philosophy. If they're headed somewhere, you try to stop them, they'll look for another way. They'll climb over, they'll climb under, they'll climb around, they keep looking for another way. What a neat philosophy. Never quit looking for a way to get where you're supposed to go. Number two, ants think winter all summer. That's an important philosophy. You can't be so naive as to think summer all summer. You say, well, isn't it nice? You can't think nice when it's nice. We will call you naive. In the summer, you got to think storm. You've got to think rock. You can't think sand and sun. Number three, ants think summer all winter. That's so important. I'm sure all winter long ants say, this won't last long, we'll soon be out here. What 
What a neat philosophy. What a neat attitude. This won't last long. We'll soon be out of here. First warm day, the ants are out. First warm day, they're out. They can't wait to get out. What a neat philosophy. Can't wait to get at it. We teach in leadership skills. Average people look forward to getting off. Successful people look forward to getting on with it. The guy doesn't want off, he wants on. And that's what starts to transform his life into the doing, into the activity. Now here's the last of the ant philosophy. How much will an ant gather during the summer to prepare for the winter? Answer, all he possibly can. What an incredible philosophy, the all you possibly can philosophy. A group of psychiatrists invited me to come and lecture in Los Angeles. I never graduated from college, but they wanted to hear my story, so I go talk to the psychiatrist. Then in the middle of my talk, I had the audacity to say, ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you what I think most messes with the mind. They said, what do you think most messes with the mind? I said, I think it is simply doing less than you can messes with the mind. It causes all kinds of psychic damage, I think. Simply being less than you can be, doing less than you could do, trying less than you could try, doing it with less enthusiasm than you could. I think it somehow damages the mind. It damages our self-image. Because here's what I've discovered happens. The minute you turn this around and start extending yourself, it isn't the value you get from extending yourself that's the greatest value. It's how you feel about yourself that's the greatest value. Because, see, it's not what we get that makes us valuable. It's what we become. And part of becoming is to see what all you can become. See what all you can do. See how much you can earn, how much you can share, how much you can start, how far you can reach, how far you can extend your influence. Now, here's number five. Measure progress. Because if you're going to play the great drama game of life, the key is to keep measuring progress to see how you're doing. How's your health doing? How's your income doing? How are your investments doing? If you're building a house, how is it coming along? What's going on? Measuring progress. That's what we call the name of the game. Here's how we teach it to our children. You must make measurable progress in reasonable time. Now we must be Hey there champions welcome back to Alpha Life motivational story the place where we are all about personal growth empowerment and making positive changes in your life today we have got something special for you five steps to change your life forever are you ready to unlock your full potential let's dive in step 1 define your vision Picture this, the life yourself you have always dreamed of. What does it look like? Take a moment to visualize your ideal life. What are your goals, passions and values? This is your random to success roadmap. Grab a pen and paper and start writing down your short time and long time goals be specific, be bold. Your vision is the fuel that will drive your journey. Step 2. Break your goals into achievable steps now that you have your vision. It's time to break it down into manageable steps, a small Consistent actions lead to big results. Focus on what you can do today to bring you closer to your dreams. Create a checklist or a timeline. Celebrate every small victory along the way. Remember, progress is progress, no matter how small. Step 3. Cultivate a positive mindset. Your mindset is the cornerstone of your success challenge negative thoughts 
practice gratitude and surround yourself with positivity. Believe in your ability to overcome obstacles. Meditation and affirmations can be powerful tools to reprogram your mind. Start each day with a positive mindset and watch how it transforms your life. Step 4. Embrace change and learn from failure. Change is inevitable on the path to success. Don't fear it. Embrace it. Failure is not the end. It's a lesson. Learn from your setbacks, adapt, and keep moving forward. I have faced my fair share of failures, <coughs> <coughs> but each one thought me something believable. It's not about avoiding failure. It's about bouncing back stronger each time. Step 5. Surround yourself with supportive people. Success is a team sport. Building a network of positive like minds, individuals who uplift and inspire you. Share your journey with those who genuinely want to see you succeed. Whether it's friends, family or an online community, having a support system makes the journey more enjoyable and re rewarding. You don't have to do it alone. And there you have it, champions. Five steps to change your life forever. Remember, transformation is a journey, not a destination. Start today, take one step at a time and watch your life unfold into a masterpiece you have always envisioned. If you found this video helpful, don't forget to like, subscribe and hit the notification bell for more empowering content. Until next time, keep staving for greatness. Now some challenges for you. Jot these down. I'm going to go through them very quickly now. You're going to have to write fast now. Here's number one. Review your performance, whether it's communication or whether it's activity or whether it's a CEO or whether it's on the job. Here's what my father said, a seminar in a sentence. I wish he was here to give it, but since he's not here, in his honor, I will give his seminar in a sentence. Here it is. Always do more than you get paid for to make an investment in your future. Now, some unions would argue with us on this. But that's my papa's seminar in a sentence. Always do more than you get paid for to make an investment in your future. My father was so unique. Papa said, if it's raining, you can't fix the roof. If it isn't raining, it doesn't need to be fixed. <laughs> he, was too, he was a grand old man. Wow, this guy. So review your performance, your language with your children. Just go over that and say, have I been too harsh and too strong, too stubborn? Should I learn to be easier, mix more compassion with the tough stuff I have to deal with? Yes. You know, prayer will help sometimes. If nothing else, you know, dear God, help me say the right thing, not to ruin it all by poor communication. Here's the next on my list. Face your fears. You know, I don't know what challenges you might have in going over the stuff we've been going over in terms of amending your philosophy or going back and, you know, redoing some stuff that you might have messed up. But face all your fears. That's how you conquer them. Don't dismiss them. Just face them. Say, here's what I'm afraid of. I wonder what I could do to change that. Here's the next one. Exercise your willpower to change direction. You don't have to keep doing what you've done the last six years, if it's not yielding you the benefits you want. In the seminar I do for Jerry, my mentor helped me to review the last six years so I wouldn't repeat those errors the next six. 
See, if you're a goose, you have no choice to do the next six like you did the last six. But if you're not a goose, here's what you can do. Pick a new destination and start going that way. You say, well, I've done this for the last two years. I'll probably have to do it another two. And the answer is no, not in a million years. Now, you can change one little degree at a time, or if you want to, you can revolutionize the whole thing. Who says you couldn't revolutionize the whole thing in a week's time and start a brand new direction that will most assuredly help you arrive in a brand new place a year from now, three years from now? No, no telling five years from now where you could arrive. Use your willpower to start the process. Just willpower to change a little or change a lot. Anybody can change. You don't have to repeat last year. Clean up the errors. Invest it now in the next year. Watch it make the difference. Here's the next one that's important. Parents have to do it. We ask our kids to do it, but we've got to do it. Admit your mistakes. Sometimes you have to admit them to others. Here's some of the best words in the English language. I'm sorry. The reason why that those are good words is because it could start a whole new relationship. It could start two people going in a whole new direction. I'm sorry. Simple, easy, not easy, but if you get this done, the turnaround can be dramatic. The early years can be big in payoff. And here's the big one. Admit your mistakes to yourself. You don't have to babble about them to everybody in the neighborhood. But it doesn't hurt to sit down and have a conversation with yourself and say, there's no use kidding myself. Here's where I really am. I've got pennies in my pocket and I've got nothing in the bank. That's what I said after the Girl Scout left my door. I had a conversation with myself. And I said, I don't want this to happen anymore. Next, refine your goals. I don't know what ambitions you've had up until now, but this weekend would be a good time to start the process. We're going to talk about our goals workshop before our session is over this weekend. Maybe that will help stimulate you to set some higher goals, reach for some higher purpose, go for something beyond what you thought you could do. By the time this weekend's over, you might double, triple, quadruple the amount of goals, purpose, all the things you think you can accomplish. You could multiply that by 10 by the time we finish here on Sunday. Here's the next one. Believe in yourself. Yes, you've you got to believe in God and you've got to believe in the community and you've got to believe in the possibilities. You've got to believe in the economy. You've got to believe that tomorrow can be better than today. But here's the big one. Believe in yourself. There isn't a skill you can't learn. There isn't a discipline you can't try. There isn't a class you couldn't take. There isn't a book you couldn't read. If it's written in some of the language, you just get it translated and read it. Here's the next one. Ask for wisdom. This is communication of the highest source. Ask for wisdom. Ask for wisdom that creates answers. Ask for the wisdom that creates faith to believe things are possible. In King Solomon's day, there was the dilemma of two mothers who claimed the same baby. And the question was, whose baby is this? This mother says, it's mine. The other mother says, no, it's mine. Solomon said, bring me the baby. They brought him the baby, and he raised the sword. He said, I'm going to cut this baby in half and give one half to this mother and one half to this mother. And as he raised his sword, sobbingly, the real mother said, no, no, no. Don't cut the baby in half. Give it to her, who was not the real mother. Solomon says, now I know who's the real mother. See, that is so wise. And the moment was such drama. But Solomon, the wisest of the wise, knew what to do to settle the deal. 
Ask for wisdom to deal with the challenges of today and tomorrow, to deal with the challenges your family brings you. Don't wish it was easier. Wish you were better. Here's the next one. Conserve your time. I must learn to do this. How much time have I got left? Not an unlimited supply. How many of these weekends can I do? Not a thousand, just a few, maybe a handful. Sometimes we get faked out. Bill Bailey says the average person says, I got 20 more years. No, Bill says you got 20 more times. If you go fishing once a year, you've only got 20 more times to go fishing, not 20 years. That fakes you out. I got 20 years. No, 20 times. See, that brings it right down to the real stuff. 20 times. How many more seminars like this? Not a thousand, a few, just a few. So would I mumble and stumble? Would I give you less than my best when I've only got a few more to give? And the answer is no, of course not. If you're a person of some dignity and quality, you wouldn't let that happen. Next, invest your profits. We're going to talk now about this before the weekend is over on financial independence. And I'm going to give you some excellent advice. Here was one of the philosophies Mr. Shof gave me, along with Mary Kay. Here's what he said. Profits are better than wages. Wages make you a living. Profits make you a fortune. Mary Kay and I went for that. Wow. Could we start earning profits while we're making a living? The answer is yes. I went berserk. Here's one now. Protect your family. These are troublesome times. Not that they haven't been troublesome times for 6,000 years. At school, troublesome times. I know a wonderful mother and a wonderful father who had two boys. In school, they went two different directions. And one became a model citizen and the other one went to jail. Wow. Protect your family as best you can from the hidden dangers, the lurking evil one. Here's the next one. Live with intensity. You might as well turn it up or notch or two after this weekend. Why not? Invest more of you in whatever you do. Be a little stronger. Be a little wiser. Step up your vitality, contribution. Put everything you've got into everything you do. And then ask for more vitality and more strength and more vigor. More heart, more soul. Next, find your place. This one now is so important. If you just work on a job, find the best place where you can serve well. And sure enough, they'll ask you to occupy a better place. And if you keep doing the job well, the guy says, well, if I had a better job, I'd really pour it on. But I got this lousy job, so I just goof off. See, that's the philosophy of disaster. So you've got a lousy job. Do the very best you can. That's your best way out. It's not to do less than you could, but to do the best you can. With that philosophy, your life can take great leaps forward. Here's a Bible phrase that says, if you work on your gifts, they will make room for you. They'll make a place for you. Here's the next one. Demand integrity from yourself. You can't demand integrity from someone else. Integrity is like loyalty. You can't demand it of someone else. You can only demand it of yourself. Be the best example of loyalty, and you'll get some loyal followers. Be the best example of integrity, and you'll have people surround you that have integrity. Lead the way. Next. Welcome the disciplines. Can't give you much better advice than that because disciplines create the reality. Disciplines build bridges, build cities. Disciplines, a well-disciplined activity creates abundance, creates uniqueness, productivity. 
Next, fight for what's right. It's a fight we're in. The, story, the storyteller says, and there was great war in heaven. Wow, you mean way back there? Yes. One third of the angels conspired. I asked Bill Bailey, how long do you suppose it took a third of these angels to get together? Did they conduct meetings? I don't know. Bailey says the storyteller doesn't say. I said, then we're supposed to use our imagination. I don't know. It does say, finally, the great war occurred. And the two-thirds prevailed and the one-third lost. One of the writers of later scripture, here's what he said, I fought a good fight. See, that's extraordinary to be able to say. I fought for my kids and I fought for what was right. And I fought for my good health. And I fought to protect my company. And I fought for a good career that would bless my family. I fought a good fight. It's good to fight. The encroachment of Opposites are in conflict, and we're in the middle. And if you want something valuable, you got to fight for it. Then this writer also said, not only have I fought a good fight, and I'll finish with this. And I got a much longer list, but maybe I can cover these at another time. He said, I fought a good fight, and I kept the faith. See, that's the deal. Keep faith with your family. Fight like crazy and keep faith. Fight the enemy and keep faith. Fight illness and keep faith. Fight the evil and keep faith. I can't give you much better advice. Simple little talk. How to go from average to fortune. There's five simple steps. Here's the first one. Get serious. That's number one. I don't know any substitute for that. You've really got to get serious. You don't have to be grim, but you must be serious. And you must get serious about two very important things. Number one is setting your goals and where you want to go. Designing the next five, the next ten years is so vitally important. What do you want to do economically? Where do you want to go? What do you want to be? What would you like to have? What would you like to share? How much would you like to earn? How far would you like to go? Those are some major questions to ask. And for that all to work out like you want it to for the next five or 10 years, in my personal opinion, you've got to get serious. Then you have to get serious about another important subject. And that important subject is called personal development. Personal development is striving hard to become the kind of person that you want to be. Ten years from now, you will surely become someone. The big question is, who? What are you becoming? And if you go to work on it now, sure enough, in a very short period of time, you can take on a new direction to become the kind of person you want to be. Now, the second point is, get smart. To make your life work out worthwhile, you've got to have some ideas. You've got to have the information. In fact, in this decade, you must be much smarter than you were in the last decade. You've got to read the books. You've got to come up with the information. When I have a chance to talk to the high school kids, that's the theme of my talk. Get smart. There's nothing worse than being stupid. And if you will read the books, learn from your experiences, do all the things that you possibly can to get the information, sure enough, you'll be wiser this year than you were last year. And I've got a few techniques that I teach in my seminar on how to get smarter, keeping a journal, going to the lectures, going to the seminars, listening to the sermons, picking up ideas from other people. You just must keep up this steady process of learning. Never cease your quest for knowledge. And that's one of the key points to go from average to fortune. Get smart. Learning is the beginning of well. Some people want to start with motivation. You don't start with motivation. Somebody says, just motivate this guy, he'll be all right. The answer is no, probably not. If a guy's an idiot, you motivate him, now you've got a motivated idiot. Don't miss the training class. You say, well, I've already been to one of those classes. I've already heard it. I've got a good praise for you to take home. That's no sign you got it. Just because you've listened to those millionaire tapes one time is no sign you've got it. I'm asking you to listen to them over and over and over. I'm asking you to dedicate yourself to a new level of learning. You know, study, learn, grow, change, develop. Don't wish it was easier. Wish you were better. Don't wish for less problems. Wish for more skills. 
That's the reason for coming here, spending a couple of days of intense effort, taking notes, rolling up your sleeves, going to work, commit yourself to learning so that you can get smarter for the days ahead. Now here's number three. You've got to get going. All of the things that you've learned will not do you that much good if you don't put it into an action plan. Get going, that's the key. Some people are ever learning, but they don't put it into action. They don't really take the action. It's like the man who keeps bringing materials to the building site and never builds anything. He keeps bringing in the sand and the gravel and the windows and the doors and the roofing material, and he just stacks up all these supplies, but he never builds anything. So that's one of the most important things to learn, how to design your days, how to design your weeks, how to design the months so that you take the proper action to get the proper return that you're looking for, whether it's economic or personal. Get going. The disciplines is the miracle process. And here's how to get the miracle of your future going as far as disciplines are concerned. Number one, do what you can. You might go home and set a whole new pace for yourself and we call it cleaning up neglect. Should walk around the block, could walk around the block for your good health, don't walk around the block. See, you're on the wrong track. Should read, could read, don't read on the wrong track. Could change, should change, don't change. You're on the wrong track. Letters you haven't written, conversations you haven't had with your family, somebody you should sit down with when you get back home, get that job done. Don't let neglect destroy your days, destroy your life, and destroy your future. Go back and do what you can. And if you'll do what you can, then life will give you some extraordinary things to do. You've got to take care of the small disciplines before life will give you a chance to handle the more complicated discipline. Good phrase to take home. All disciplines affect each other. It's so easy to be casual and say, well, this doesn't matter. This doesn't matter. I'm telling you, everything matters. Of course, some things matter more than others, but there isn't anything that doesn't matter. Let us not neglect, do not neglect the small of the difference and build on that foundation and you can have everything you could possibly want. Now here's number four, you must get excited. And not just the false enthusiasm of just pure positive thinking. You've got to get excited over some very basic things. One is get excited over your ability to make yourself do the necessary things because discipline is major step one toward personal progress. And anytime a person wishes to, they can make major changes in their life, personally and socially and financially. It doesn't ever have to be the same after today. No telling what you could do today if you really wish to. So that's number four, get excited. Get excited about your potential. Human capacity is usually never the problem. Little children can learn several languages. We can learn to do the most incredible things. All we need to do is take the time to do it. So it's not a matter of capacity. It's a matter of judgment. It's a matter of excitement. It's a matter of will. And it's a matter of wanting too bad enough. So it's pretty exciting to know that any day you wish, you can change your life. Excitement that runs deep is the excitement that really lasts for a lifetime, not surface excitement. I'll tell you what's really going to serve you well, and that's the excitement you feel inside that isn't even probably expressed on the outside, the excitement that runs deep, the excitement that stirs commitment, the excitement that stirs courage. Give me the chance, and I will get the job done. That kind of excitement. Number five is get away. You've got to learn to get away. You must learn to get away and be alone. Learn to get away and reflect. Learn to get away and learn how to live as well as how to earn. How sad it would be to learn how to earn well, but not learn how to live well. You must balance your life. We teach something, especially in my staff, I teach it some, something called lifestyle. Lifestyle is how you learn to live your life. Some people have money, but they don't even know how to spend it. They have time, but they don't know how to spend it. They don't know what to do with it. They don't get joy from it, rather they get animosity. Then you've got to take time to cultivate good friends. You've got to take time to be with your family. You've got to take time to be with the people who are important to you. Get away, take the time, reflect on your life, recharge your batteries, do some growing away from your enterprise. 
Then when you come back to your enterprise, after you have taken this time to balance your life, you will find that on the job, working on your enterprise, things will really go much better. So those are the five simple steps to go from average to fortune. I learned the law of sowing and reaping. And in the law of sowing and reaping is And I say, I thought, sure, John, it'd last a week. <laughs> what happened? Jot this down. The hot weather is going to get some. And this is not of your making. 
here's what you must say when that happens. Isn't that interesting? Wow. What can you do? The answer is nothing. You say, well, I'm going to try to change this. I wouldn't take that class. You know, the sun comes up in the east. Somebody says, why is that? I wouldn't spend much time on that. Just, <laughs> just let that happen. Don't go for this why, why, why stuff. I'm giving you the answers here. The answers is in, is in the structure and the consequences and in the deal. The answer is in the deal. Anything beyond that is not worth studying. You say, well, how come some just last a little while? I wouldn't sign up for that class. Here's the answer. Some don't stay. You just... You just have to jot that down. And when some leaves, you say, that's one of those that don't stay. You just you, Now you know what category to put them in. And you can't solve this now. You can't, it's like rearranging the seasons. You can't fool with that. All you can do is cooperate with the way things are set up. I didn't set it up. You say, well, it shouldn't be this way. Well, when you get your own planet, you can rearrange this whole deal. <laughs> but on this planet, you're a guest. You got to take it as it comes. Now, here was the secret to the ambitious sower with good seed. It said he kept on sowing. Now, here's what he had to do to keep on sowing. He had to discipline his disappointment. This is the key phrase now to use the rest of your life. You must learn to discipline your disappointment because you didn't set up the setup and some are not going to stay and that is not of your making. Now, if you made gross errors and you ran them off, see, that'd be different. Now, you're responsible for that. But if it's in the normal... It's just the way it is.
When I found out at age 25 that my income was primarily determined by my so make that note now and if you if you know it that's wonderful if you teach it that's even better your income is primarily determined by your philosophy not the economy I had no concept of that when I was 25 years old I would have sworn to you because when my mentor said to me how come you're not doing well I showed him my paycheck he said look this is all the company pays he said no that's all the company pays you I thought, well, that's a new way to look at it. Speaking of philosophy, how would you go from $5 an hour to $6 an hour? Let me give you some examples on philosophy that can get you from $5 an hour to $6 an hour. Here's number one. Wait for the government to change the minimum wage. That's simple and easy, right? If you wait long enough, sure enough, the government will change the minimum wage, let's say, to $6. Now, by law, the company must pay you six dollars so you're home free you say yes but how long will it take answer i'm sure much longer than you want to wait but that's the first philosophy wait for the government here's number two wait for the company to pay you six dollars an hour how long will that take how often is the review six months one year let's say you don't make it second year say well that's a long time to go from five to six it is a long time but that's the next philosophy. Wait for the company. Here's the third philosophy. And that's to go on strike. We call it the philosophy of demand. I demand $6 or I won't work. Now, if you're by yourself, this is a risky philosophy. If you've got a thousand people now to take with you to the company and say, all thousand of us will not work unless we get $6, now you might have a chance. But by yourself, this philosophy doesn't work very well. The philosophy of demand only works by collective bargaining, we call it. Okay. And it does work. However, it's very limiting. You might get an extra penny or two, you might get an extra dollar, you might get an extra benefit, but it's very limiting, the philosophy of demand. And here's what for sure, jot this down. Using the philosophy of demand, you cannot get rich if getting rich is of interest to you. You can't get rich using this philosophy. Gosh, it's so sad when somebody is in the right. So now, what would be the next philosophy that might work better for all of us? And I'm sure it's one of the reasons why all of us got here to this room today. Here it is, the philosophy of performance. The philosophy of performance simply states, I will perform so well arriving early, staying late, doing all the extra things that the company would easily. My father gave one of the greatest seminars in a simple little sentence. Here's what Papa said. I wish he was here to say it, but since he's gone, I'll say it for him. Here's what he said. Always do more than you get paid for. Now, some unions would argue with us on that point and say, no, that messes up the system. But this is what Papa said. Always do more than you get paid for to make an investment in your future. These are philosophies. Follow. Your income is determined primarily by your... Is it possible to multiply your income by 10? All kids need to hear this. It's not being taught, I don't think, in the local school. I never heard it until I was 25. It's possible to multiply your income by 10. If we searched around the Palm Springs area, could we find somebody that makes $50 an hour? And the answer is yes, of course. So it's possible to multiply your income by 10. That's $500 an hour. If we searched around this area, would we have to search very long until we find someone that makes $500 an hour? No, everybody agrees. So it's not only possible to multiply your income by 10, it's possible to multiply by 10 again. $5,000 an hour. What do you suppose I get paid? It's, it's not open for public disclosure. I've lectured with, you know, Schwarzkopf and Colin Powell and Henry Kissinger and all the rest. They get paid well. Schwarzkopf gets 65000 for one hour speaking. 
So all you have to do is become a general in the army, win the Gulf War, you get 65,000 for a one hour speech. Now Bill Clinton gets what, 125,000 for a one hour speech. And then this just keeps on going, on up to the stratosphere. Someone earned 36 million last year for one year's work. So that's the ladder. Now jot this down, to climb this ladder as high as you wish. And you got to underline the word wish. Because part of your future now is what you wish and what you want. How much property will they let you own in America? As much as you want. This is wish want country. You've dropped into the right place. In a country where you can have as much as you want, and as much as you wish. See that, wouldn't that be puzzling to people outside the country? as much as you wish. To climb this ladder as high as you wish in terms of bringing value to the marketplace and becoming valuable to the marketplace as high as you wish. Here's all you have to do and learn to work. However, we do not get paid for time. So we cross that out. Mistakenly, the man says, I'm making about $20 for an hour. Not true. If that was true, you could just stay home, right? And have them send your money. So that's not true. We don't get paid for time. We get paid for value brought to the marketplace. Now, since that's true, here's one of the key questions of my talk to you today. Is it possible to become twice as valuable to the marketplace and make twice as much money in the same time? Is that possible? The answer is yes. Could you become three times as valuable as you might be right now to the marketplace and make three times as much money in the same time? And the answer is yes. Five times, 10 times? Of course. America is unique. It's a ladder to climb. It starts down here, let's say at $5 an hour, and it keeps going up. Now that's a heck of a ladder. That's why everybody wants to come here, right? The boat people are not headed for Vietnam. Uh, people haven't plotted and schemed for 50 years saying if I could just get to Poland, everything would be okay. Not true. Everybody wants to come to America. And the reason is because we've got the best wind ever blowing in our favor. We've got the best economic opportunity anybody's had in six and a half thousand years. And all you have to do is understand it and take advantage of it. Now there's some key questions to ask here. Why would the marketplace pay someone only $5 an hour? Very simple answer. They're not very valuable to the marketplace. Now we must underline to the marketplace. This person might be a very valuable brother. Yes. Valuable member of the church. Of course. Valuable citizen of the country. Yes. Valuable in the sight of God. No doubt. We're all of equal value in the sight of God. But if you're not very valuable to the marketplace, you don't get much money. You say, well, it shouldn't be that way. Well, then you've got to start your own country. You know, this one's been in process for 200 years, and this is the best we've been able to come up with so far. Now, there was a big debate in Congress last year that this $5 was not enough, should be six, should be six, should be six. But we don't need legislation. Six is already on this ladder. The next step up. You know, if you work for McDonald's, they'll pay you $5 an hour to take out the trash. If you whistle while you take out the trash, they'll pay you $6 an hour. So we don't need that legislation. You need, just need to take lessons on how to whistle. Have a good attitude. Now, as you begin to climb this ladder, why would the... Answer, evidently, they must be more valuable to the marketplace. Ten times more valuable. And is that possible for someone to be 10 times more valuable and earn $50 an hour instead of five? And the answer is yes. That's what America is all about. Now, why would the marketplace pay some people $500 an hour? Evidently, this person must be much more valuable to the marketplace. That's what's important to understand to the marketplace. And would the marketplace pay one person 80? And the answer is, of course. If you helped a company make a billion dollars, would they pay you 80 million? 
I'm telling you, it is possible. And that's why America is so exciting. That's why this financial ladder is so exciting. It's possible for all of this to come true for all of you, no matter where you start, as a student in school, just getting started out there in the workplace, this is all possible for you. Now, Mr. Shelf gave me the clue on how to climb this ladder as high as I wanted to climb. Now, we're talking primarily economics here. There's a lot of other ways to become valuable to your family, valuable to your friends, valuable to the community, valuable to the team, right? Valuable to the team effort, valuable to the concert. But here's what he said to me. In climbing this ladder economically, all you have to do is work harder on yourself than you do on your job. Once I heard that, it made sense to me. Here's the next one, pay your taxes. Here's what paying taxes does, feeds the goose the opportunity. Probably true, but make the note, better a fat goose than no goose. My personal philosophy is everybody should pay federal taxes as well as state or whatever else. It's not wise for the government to let one third of American citizens off the federal tax rolls. If you let them off the federal tax rolls, it robs them of the dignity. They have to pay state taxes. They have to pay uh, sales tax. I've been trying to write this book for so long called, Of Course Kids Should Pay Taxes. When a kid in California walks into 7-Eleven and buys, the proprietor asks the kid for eight more pennies. The kid says, what's these eight pennies? He says, that's the taxes. The kid says, I'm only eight years old. And the proprietor says, congratulations, you're my youngest taxpayer. Give me the money. Yes, if you want to ride your bicycle on the sidewalk instead of in the mud, you got to cough up the eight pennies. What if you're poor? Do you pay the eight pennies? Yes, what if you're rich? Yes, meaning everybody should pay. The same should apply to federal. I don't care if it's $10 a year. I don't care if it's only $100 a year. As poor as you might be, you've got to say, no matter how poor I am at the moment, I will make my contribution. So everybody should pay. How much do you think aircraft carriers cost? We pay our taxes so a policeman will walk the beats. Hey, the Air Force doesn't sleep. The army doesn't sleep 24 hours, so you can sleep as much time as required. Peace of mind. The missiles are ready and the aircraft carriers are there. So you got that down now? I got to pay from my aircraft carrier. I got to pay some young volunteer that risks his life. Aircraft carrier, you got to pay if you want that kind of security in the world. Of course, we may disagree sometimes with government policy and all the rest, but I'm telling you, everybody needs to pay. Now, here's one of the best stories ever written. According to the record, Jesus and his disciples one day were at the synagogue. And on this occasion, they had an interesting project. And that was to stand outside the synagogue as people started coming in, putting money in the treasury of the synagogue. And as Jesus and his disciples stood outside watching the people come by, putting their money in the treasury, it said some came with large amounts, put them in the treasury. It said some came by with modest amounts, some came by with small amounts. Then along comes a little lady and she puts two pennies in the treasury. And Jesus said to his disciples, look at that. They said, two pennies, what's two pennies? He says, no. You don't understand. She gave more than everybody else. They said two pennies is more than everybody else. He said, yes, because I'm positive her two pennies represented most of what she had. So since she gave most of what she had, she gave the most. Now, here's what did not occur in the story. I'm so brilliant. I can give you what the author left out. 
Here's what did not occur. When the little lady put her two pennies in the treasury and walked away, here's what didn't occur. Jesus didn't run after this little lady and said, hold it, hold it, little lady. My disciples and I have decided that you're so pitiful and you're so poor. We have decided to take the two pennies out of the treasury and give them back to you. I'm telling you that did not occur. If it would have occurred, she would have been what? Insulted. Hey, it was only two pennies, but it was most of what I had. Would you rob me of the joy of giving my two pennies? So that scene did not occur. So jot this down. Jesus left her two pennies in the treasury, even though she was poor. What does that mean? Everybody needs to pay, even if it's only two pennies. Welcome to the new Fresh Motivation app, where you'll find daily motivation, daily quotes, listen to your favorite speeches in the background or with a black screen, so nothing interrupts your motivational moment, where you can create your personal profile, create playlists of your favorite speeches and quotes, add personal notes, and start setting goals. Fresh Motivation, the home of motivation. Get it now for free on Google Play. Now, what I'd like to give you is what I think are the five major pieces to the life puzzle. Five major pieces to the life puzzle. If we can study each of the pieces and then put it all together, the chances of it running well are just a lot better. Mr. Shope gave me a simple formula when I first met him, and let me give it to you. He said there's usually about a half dozen things makes 80% of the difference. There's about a half dozen wealth things, about a half dozen health things that can give you the 80% solution to the problem. Then Mr. Shove said, be a student of those half dozen basic things. Pretty good advice. Success is not doing extraordinary things. Success is doing ordinary things extraordinarily well. So if you just learn to do it well, key things well, learn to speak well. Poor people can talk and rich people can talk. Looks like rich people talk better. Uh, learning to speak is called survival. Learning to speak well is called success. So let me give you what I think are fundamental pieces to life and um, we'll take it from there. Here's the first one. Philosophy. Philosophy in very simple terms is simply what you know. And what you know greatly affects how your life works out. We might also add what you don't know greatly affects how your life works out. The idea you miss could be the missing number in trying to put the numbers in the lock. So what you don't know will hurt you to correct an old cliche and to correct another one. Ignorance is not bliss. It's important to know. It's important to get the information. Now we do something very important with what we know. We weigh it. That's another good word. We weigh. Weigh everything before you do it, before you buy it, before you try it. Make sure you weigh it. Everything you get ready to do, you get to decide whether it's a major or a minor. And you don't want to give minor things major time. You don't want to give something insignificant, significant amounts of your energy. So we simply use the phrase weigh before you pay. Sophisticated people learn to weigh everything. And what we all need is a good set of mental scales to weigh everything. What if you got information and your mental scales were off and insignificant things to you were significant? Wouldn't that be a major handicap the rest of your life? When you weighed something, important things weighed unimportant. We would call that a great handicap. So it's very important to weigh everything properly. And that's the reason for sermons and songs and lyrics and lectures and seminars and and conversations and professors and teachers. It's one of the reasons why we converse, we converse with each other and we debate and we think about and we ponder and we perceive and we weigh and, and we try to find out where the values are. Because you don't want to proceed and give big chunks of your life to something that's insignificant. Okay, so we get information, we weigh it, then we come to conclusions about values 
big question in forming your life, where are the values? What is important? What should weigh heavy on my mind and I should give it significant time and significant energy and significant money? Shum said to me, poor thinking habits keeps most people poor. Not poor working habits, most people work hard but they don't think hard. They don't use their mind to really try to perceive where the values are so that they don't waste any time. It's easy to spend big chunks of your life on insignificant things. It's one of the major pieces of the life puzzle, what you think about, knowledge, how you weigh it, the conclusions you come to, the values you've perceived, thinking. If you really want to help somebody change their life, you have to start changing their mind, change their philosophy, change how they think. Somebody says, well, just motivation, that'll do. And the answer is no, motivation won't do it. If a guy's an idiot and you motivate him, you've got a motivated idiot. Right? <laughs> Say, no, that, that's not what it takes. Now, it's very easy to make errors in judgment. Errors in judgment. I'm now the teaching people, even, out of, even, even after they're out of school, university, college, they should read at least uh, one or two books a week. It's easy when you get out of school, right, and get a job to just sort of let that all slide, not keep up the learning process. But if you don't keep up the learning process, a lot of values become fuzzy if you don't keep trying to perceive what's important, what's not important, and then start spending major effort on minor things. So we have to keep learning. What if a guy spent his book money on donuts, right? We would call him greatly deprived mentally. In 10 years, the guy's bought two tons of donuts and only two books, right? Mostly with pictures, right? And he wonders why his life isn't working well. Reason. After he got out of school, he didn't keep up the flow of ideas that can help to refine your business and help to refine your decisions and help you come to better conclusions. You've got to keep up the learning curve, even after you're out of school, to make sure that you're not making errors in judgment. The reason why most people wind up average at age 40 instead of rich is simply an error in judgment about what to do with your money. What would you suggest a 15 year old start as a plan to do with their money so that by 40 they're rich instead of average? You gotta have a good plan, right? If you start making errors early with your money, those errors can, uh, can make your life mediocre instead of rich. You wind up with pennies instead of fortune. And you wind, you wind up with crumbs instead of a feast, simply because early you made errors on what to do with your money. The guy says, well, it's only $10. So what does it matter what I do with it? And the answer is, it, 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 that's when it really matters is when you don't have much. The guy says, oh, if I had a fortune, I'd really take good care of it, but I've only got a paycheck, so I don't know where it goes. We call those great errors in judgment. It's so important to make sure you've got a good plan when the amounts are small. But it's easy to make errors. It's easy not to know. It's easy to miscalculate. And if you miscalculate, some things keep adding and adding and adding. I got a good phrase for you. Life is accumulative. Good phrase to know. Life is accumulative. Our errors either accumulate into what we don't get or our wise decisions accumulate into what we do get. Now, the key is to correct the errors as early as possible. Fortunately, Mr. Shof caught me at age 25, started asking me major questions. At age 25, he said, Mr. Owen, how long have you been working? And I said, I've been working uh, six years. I started working when I was 19. He said, well, six years. How much money have you saved and invested in the last six years? I said, not any. He said, who sold you on that plan? Wow, six years is, is enough time now to check and see if you've got a good financial philosophy. And the time to catch the errors is early, early. So Mr. Shoff started asking me those tough questions at age 25. How about your money? How about your resources? How about your investments? And you say, well, I, I've got plenty of time to worry about that and be concerned about that later. And the answer is probably not. Now's the time to fix it. Wherever you hear the good information, that's the time to start fixing. So we're teaching kids now a good wealth philosophy. Starting at age 50, 15 will make you wealthy by age 40, 45 at the latest if you're a little slow. 
Start doing wise things with your resources. When, when would you suggest people should do wise things with their resources? Answer, as soon as they get the better information. Now you can't do what you don't know, but the key is to keep learning so that good ideas keep occurring to you. Now you can do more wise things, okay? But philosophy is where it all begins, what you know. Now to know wise things, you simply have to study as you're doing, keep up the reading, keep up the conversations, keep up the listening to lectures, keep going through the information, keep stashing it away, taking the notes, right? There's no better way to adjust your philosophy than to have a continual flow of ideas. But that's the first piece of the life puzzle, philosophy. Now, here's number two. Philosophy determines attitude. Attitude is simply how you feel. First, what you know sets the sail of your life. Now, how you feel starts taking you there. Attitude. Now, there's all kinds of ways to feel, right? You can feel good or you can feel bad. Here's one attitude. If this is all they pay, I'm not coming early and I'm not staying late on the job. That's an attitude, right? If this is all they pay, I don't come early and I don't stay late. Now, do you suppose that that attitude, if you carried it through the rest of your life, do you suppose that attitude would greatly affect your life as the years unfold? The answer is overwhelmingly, of course. Here's another attitude. No matter what they pay, I always come early and I always stay late to invest in my own future. Isn't that fascinating? Attitude is by choice. You can either choose to come early or you can choose to come late. You can either choose to leave early or you can choose to stay late. Attitude's a matter of choice. Now, to make wise choice, we need educated attitudes. Emotions must go to school to learn where the values are. Okay, good phrase. Emotions must go to school. When kids are young, right? A three-year-old, you know, falls on the floor and kicks his feet and screams. We say, well, that's okay when you're three, but it isn't okay when you're 30. Right? As a little kid, right, you can retaliate and punch somebody out. But when you're 23, we say, no, no, you got to learn now to take that emotion and send it to school and find out where the values are. It's okay to feel strong, but you've got to learn to restrain yourself in a society if you want life to go well for you. So attitudes now become a matter of educated choice, educated choice. But how we feel is going to greatly determine how our life works out. Now, it's how you feel about a variety of things. Let me give you that list. Number one, it's how you feel about the past. Now, when you're young, you haven't got that much past to feel about, but I'm sure you've had some ups and downs. You've had some wins and losses. So part of our attitude is based on how we feel about the past. Some people are still carrying the burdens of the past. They're affected by some difficulties, some losses, whatever. They're carrying it around like a burden. Instead of using the past as a school, uh, they're using it as a threat to their life. So part of it is solving the attitude about the past, how you feel about it. Number two, it's how you feel about the future. Facing the future, very important, key part of our life. Now there's two ways to face the future. Here they are. One, anticipation. That's one way to face the future, anticipation. Here's the other way, apprehension. Now, most people face the future with apprehension, primarily because they bought somebody else's view. They don't have their own future well designed. So in the absence of having your own future well designed, you have a tendency to be persuaded to buy somebody else's future. Here's what's going to happen. Here's what's going to happen. Boy, it's easy to let your days be clouded by all of that. So some days, somewhere along the line, you've got to start settling for sure how you feel about the future and how you feel about it greatly determines what you do. If you don't feel good about the future by having goals set, you take what we call uncertain steps. It's difficult to be confident about the day if you don't have your future well designed. So here's one of the keys to do about your future. Set goals, write them down. 
design the future. Where do you want to go? What do you want to do? What do you want to be? What do you want to see? What do you want to have? What do you want to share? Even if it all changes 12 months from now, the key is to start making a list now. The cities you want to visit, the people you'd like to meet, your health goals, your investment goals, all that stuff, start writing it, putting it in a journal somewhere. And let it all change as time unfolds. Something that you think is very important right now, two years from now, you'll say, that was kind of foolish. How come I thought that was so important, right? Because you'll grow beyond that. But right now it's important to get as clear a picture of you can, as you can of the future. Set your dreams, set your goals. Because it's important. How the day goes is greatly determined by your confidence about the future. Now here's another attitude. It's how you feel about each other. It's how you feel about society and the community and the country. It's very important. It's not that difficult to be a cynic. And cynicism greatly influences how your life works out. But it's also important to understand that if you want to do well, it takes all of us to help each of us. Good phrase. It takes all of us to help each of us do well. You can't succeed by yourself. It's hard to find a rich hermit. But you can't succeed by yourself. You need a market. You need a society. We need each other's ideas. We need each other's collective ideas. Collective participation in the marketplace, society. Okay. So how we feel about each other, very important. Now here's the big one. It's how you feel about yourself. How you feel about yourself. Self-esteem, understanding your own value. Boy, if new discovery starts to unfold for you, that you've got the brains, you've got the talent, all you need is instruction, all you need is some coaching, all you need is some help, all you need is some advice, some experience. If you're headed down the wrong road, hopefully somebody's already been down that road where the bridge is out. And they come back saying, don't go this way anymore, the bridge is out. So we take somebody else's advice and we say, wow, I'm glad you came along, I'm heading down this road. So learning from other people's experiences, picking up all the ideas so that we can feel good about ourselves. Now, self-esteem primarily becomes from, comes from engaging in the disciplines that lead to value. Self-esteem comes from engaging in the disciplines that lead to value. We don't lack potential, but to bring value from potential, we need the disciplines. Now, one of the major things that makes us not feel good about ourselves is not engaging in the disciplines. If you keep letting yourself off the hook or just ho-humming it and letting it all slide, then you don't feel good about yourself. Best is the ant philosophy, right? To feel good about yourself, do your best, gather all you can during the summer. We call that the ant philosophy. Ants don't settle for half. They go for all, all you possibly can. Do the best you can. It's the greatest lift of self-esteem is doing the best you can. Okay, so attitude plays such an important part in the five pieces of the life puzzle. Now, what's next? Number three. First is philosophy. Second is attitude. Philosophy and attitude determines activity. Activity is what you do. Key phrase, success is a doing. You actually now have to do it. It seems as though God has designed that the major part of the value of our life is, less to, is left to our own mental genius. You've got to decide what you want to become. Then you simply have to go do it, engaging in the disciplines. Now the activity part is so important. How hard should you work when you get ready to labor, when you get ready to try to be successful in the marketplace? How many days should you spend? How hard should you work? Well, let me give you an Old Testament phrase to consider. It says six days activity, one day rest. Now that's called a philosophy on activity, right? What should be the ratio of rest to activity? Old Testament suggests six one. Now I know that goes back a long ways. Some people said, no, six, six one's old fashioned. Five two is better. Well, you've got to take a look at 5-2 and see if it's okay. You don't just want to buy somebody's philosophy without seeing if it 
if it leads to fortune and if it leads to unique things, wonderful, it's probably good. But you have to check out if 5-2 is okay. Would 4-3 uh, be better? I don't know. You've got to check everything. I do know this. Good phrase. Don't rest too long. I got a good point for you. Make rest a necessity, not an objective. The objective of, of life is not to rest. The objective of life is to accomplish, to growth, full growth, full accomplishment, test the outer limits of your abilities. That's what life is all about. See what all you can do. That's what life is all about. See what you can do with the seasons and the soil and the seed. See what you can do with your brain. See what you can do with your talent and your gifts and your skills. That's what life's all about. See what you can do. Mm -hmm. Now, we need rest, but you must make rest a necessity, not an objective. If you make it an objective, you start falling into what we call the average syndrome. Right? People who live mediocre lives are always looking forward to getting off. Successful people are always looking forward to getting on. Successful people don't want off. They want on. They want to get on with the job. They rest only enough to gather strength. So consider that in your argument, in your debate on how hard should you work. Let me give you another Bible philosophy. I'm, my parents made sure I was a pretty good scholar by the time I was 18. And I'm an amateur on the Bible. But here's another good philosophy. Whatever your hands currently find to do, do it with all your might. Whatever you're doing, do it with all your might. We call that philosophy on activity. How hard should you work? As hard as you can in the time allotted to labor. In leadership, management lectures we teach, when you work, work, when you play, play. Don't play at work and don't work at play. Right? Make best use of your time. When you're working, pour it on. And when you're playing, have a good time. But don't play at work. Okay. So activity, very important piece in this whole life puzzle in working. So you've got to test how hard you can work. Part of it is physical, your own physical limitation. Some people can take 14 hours, no problem. Some people 10 stretches pretty much their physical limitation. So everybody has to sort of decide how hard you can work, how much time you can put in. When you come to university, right, you got to sort of find out how much workload you can handle, how many classes can you go through, how much can you unravel, how many study hours do you need, how much effort have you got, when are you going to run out of gas, right, and you need to replenish the supply. So we all have to study our own activity habits. But let me give you what I think is the best philosophy. It is simply do the best you can in activity. We call it doing your best. A man asked me one time, he said, I'm making about $50,000 a year, isn't that enough? What would you tell somebody? A businessman said to me, he said, my kids aren't starving, and he said, I got my bills paid, and he said, we're doing pretty good, and I'm making about $50,000 a year, isn't that enough? He asked me, what do you suppose I told him? I said, yes, it's enough if it's the best you can do. We don't call an amount enough, we call your best enough. I said, if you're capable of making a half million dollars a year and you make $50,000 a year, we call you loser. And we don't call you loser because of the difference between 50,000 and a half million. We call you loser because you're not doing your best. If you do your best and you make 10,000 a year, that's enough. If you do your best and you make a million dollars a year, that's enough. Enough is not the difference between 10,000 and a million. Enough is simply doing the best you can. So that's the key to the good life. When the day is finished, if you say, did I do my best? And if I'm not doing my best, why not? Do I, have I got some errors in my philosophy that says, hey, half effort's okay. Just slide by, ho-hum it, cross your fingers and everything will work out, hopefully. Say, no, I don't want to take those kind of chances. I don't want to drift, okay? So activity, just put a big question mark on activity and say, here's a major piece of life to keep checking. Make sure I'm doing my best. That's all I require, my best. A group of psychiatrists asked me to come and lecture for them in Los Angeles one time, which I thought was interesting since I only went to one year of college. 
And then in the middle of my lecture, I had the audacity to say, ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you what I think most messes with the mind. They said, what do you think most messes with the mind? I said, I think what most messes with the mind is simply doing less than you can. It sets up all kinds of psychic problems, doing less than you can. Guess when you really feel good about yourself? When you've done the best you can. You don't even have to win the full prize if you do the best you can. We call that the ultimate winning, doing the best you can. Wow, there's no, nothing like the soaring self-confidence that comes from putting out what we call full effort in whatever you do. It's called full effort. Philosophy, activity, attitude leads to number four, results. And that's what life is all about. Putting the first three together, good philosophy, attitude, high activity to get the ultimate called results. I got a good phrase for you. Results is the name of the game. Now the challenge of life is a very simple phrase. Let me give it to you. I think you'll find it interesting to at least ponder. The challenge of life is to make measurable progress in reasonable time. Measurable progress in reasonable time. First, we don't want to be unreasonable with time. If you and I agree to do something, five minutes later I'm asking you, how are you doing? You say, I haven't left the building yet. You can't ask in five minutes. Five minutes is too soon. That's unreasonable. Now, if I don't ask you for five years, we call that too late. You can't wait five years and you can't go five minutes. Right? You, we all have to learn what is reasonable time to expect somebody to make progress, to grow, to change, to develop. So all of us have to learn, especially if you're going to become leaders, entrepreneurs, if you're going to have management responsibilities and work with people, you've got to understand what is reasonable time. We don't want to be unreasonable with time. But here's what else we expect. Measurable progress in reasonable time. How many years should the child spend in fourth grade? Approximately. About one. You say, well, if they're nice kids, would you give them three or four? You say, no, you can't spend four years in fourth grade. It's unacceptable. We put on the family pressure. We put on peer pressure, right? We put on all kinds of pressure. You can't spend four years in fourth grade. Now, wouldn't that be interesting if we applied the same kind of social pressure all of our lives? What would be acceptable to society for wise investments to have been made by age 30 so that you can really properly take care of yourself and your family. Somehow we've missed those standards, right? Shouldn't it be popular to be wealthy by age 40? And shouldn't we look at somebody who by age 45 is not at least financially independent saying, where have you been, uh, Tibet or Bangladesh you probably have spent you mean you've been here all this time? Right? Shouldn't we make it a bit unacceptable not to be well off in what we call reasonable time? But what if a guy spent his potential fortune on non-essentials from age 15 to age 45? Shouldn't we call that unacceptable? Shouldn't teenagers ask their parents, how come we're not rich? We live in a rich country. This is America. Aren't those good questions? How about the wisdom of a good plan versus a poor plan? What if a man was a farmer and he ate his seed corn? Instead of planting it, he ate it. Wouldn't we make arrangements to go get his children? And say, the kids aren't safe. The man's insane. He eats his seed corn. He doesn't plant it. Wow. I just offer that as kind of an interesting question. If we make such pressure demands for fourth grade, why shouldn't we make those same pressure demands for the rest of life? Interesting question, right? Good debatable question. Now, part of it is we simply, society eases back on us as far as ongoing demand of results. But here's what I'd ask you to do. Make the demands on yourself. 
I'm asking you not to let yourself off the hook. Society will let you get by with far less than you want to be. When you get out of university, how many books will the community demand that you read every month? Approximately. About none. So if you're going to do the extra reading, guess what? You got to develop that philosophy and put that pressure on yourself. But what I'm asking you to do is take a good look at results. Now, another reason why we look at results, results at age 25, results at age 30 on a wide variety of things, health and wealth and culture and, and sophistication and lifestyle and uniqueness. We keep checking all those results. Here's why. To see if there's any errors in activity. Guess how easy it is to make errors in activity? It's easy. We teach in our leadership series, don't mistake movement for achievement. Boy, sometimes it's easy to be faked out by being busy. The guy's busy 10 hours a day, but he's going in figure eights. The guy's not making progress. He's stalled, but he's busy. And he thinks being busy is going to do it. Say, no, you've got to be busy doing the right things. So maybe you need activity fixed. Maybe you need activity attitude fixed who knows the guy who says since they don't pay well i come late and leave early we say john that's going to affect you all your life and you've probably got the results to show it or maybe we need a correction of philosophy that's why we check results now here's the last piece in the life puzzle it's called lifestyle Lifestyle is simply how you choose to live. We call lifestyle the genius of living well. Now, here's what's exciting about lifestyle as a subject of one of the major pieces of the life puzzle. All of us can choose, especially in this country, all of us can choose how we wish to live. Guess what you can get from your money? Joy or animosity however you wish to live a father takes a ten dollar bill and wads it up and throws it at his son and says if you need the darn stuff that bad take it we call it money without style the father's got the money but he doesn't have the style he studied economics but he didn't study happiness so let me give you the phrase. Happiness is an art, not an accident. Some people have figured out things economically, but they haven't figured out lifestyle to live well. Culture is a study. It's not an amount. Somebody says, if you have an amount of money, you'll be cultured. And the answer is no. Cultured is a study. Cultured, culture is a refinement of the mind. To be cultured, you must study culture and practice culture. Money doesn't solve the culture challenge. Money doesn't solve the happiness challenge. To be happy, you got to study and practice happiness. And Mr. Shove taught me all the simple ways to get joy from substance. A sophisticated gentleman knows that a rose on time is more valuable than a thousand dollar gift too late. It's not the amount that counts, it's the genius that counts. It's the ideas that count. So here's what I'm challenging you to do. How to be happy with what you've got while you pursue what you want. And I'll give you time to make a note of that phrase because I think it's so important to wrap it up. How to be happy with what you've got while you pursue what you want. So I would challenge you in the last piece of the life puzzle, find ways to live uniquely. Now, if you look at your life on all these five pieces, this is why I'm asking you to just go back through and re review these notes. How am I doing on philosophy? Are there some things I don't know? Am I making some errors in judgment that's gonna bring me to no good end, right? Three years from now, five years from now. Key phrase, 10 years from now, you will arrive. The question is where? Good question, where? And the follow-up is, now's the time to fix the next 10 years. Now's the time to fix the next 10 years. And hopefully, with a discussion of these five subjects, we've given you some uh, viewpoints, at least from my experience. And uh, hopefully, I've done a little coaching here today and 
you can take these subjects and debate them and talk about them and think about them, and they'll help you with life in the future. Simple little talk. How to go from average to fortune. There's five simple steps. Here's the first one. Get serious. That's number one. I don't know any substitute for that. You've really got to get serious. You don't have to be grim, but you must be serious. And you must get serious about two very important things. Number one is setting your goals and where you want to go. Designing the next five, the next 10 years is so vitally important. What do you want to do economically? Where do you want to go? What do you want to be? What would you like to have? What would you like to share? How much would you like to earn? How far would you like to go? Those are some major questions to ask. And for that all to work out like you want it to for the next five or 10 years, in my personal opinion, you've got to get serious. Then you have to get serious about another important subject. And that important subject is called personal development. Personal development is striving hard to become the kind of person that you want to be. 10 years from now, you will surely become someone. The big question is, who? What are you becoming? And if you go to work on it now, sure enough, in a very short period of time, you can take on a new direction to become the kind of person you want to be. Now, the second point is get smart. To make your life work out worthwhile, you've got to have some ideas. You've got to have the information. In fact, in this decade, you must be much smarter than you were in the last decade. You've got to read the books. You've got to come up with the information. When I have a chance to talk to the high school kids, that's the theme of my talk, get smart. There's nothing worse than being stupid. And if you will read the books, learn from your experiences, do all the things that you possibly can to get the information, sure enough, you'll be wiser this year than you were last year. And I've got a few techniques that I teach in my seminar on how to get smarter, keeping a journal, going to the lectures, going to the seminars, listening to the sermons, picking up ideas from other people. You just must keep up this steady process of learning. Never cease your quest for knowledge. And that's one of the key points to go from average to fortune. Get smart. Learning is the beginning of wealth. Some people want to start with motivation. You don't start with motivation. Somebody says, just motivate this guy, he'll be all right. The answer is no, probably not. If a guy's an idiot, you motivate him. Now you've got a motivated idiot. Don't miss the training class. You say, well, I've already been to one of those classes. I've already heard it. Got a good phrase for you to take home. That's no sign you got it. Just because you've listened to those millionaire tapes one time is no sign you've got it. I'm asking you to listen to them over and over and over. I'm asking you to dedicate yourself to a new level of learning. You know, study, learn, grow, change, develop. Don't wish it was easier. Wish you were better. Don't wish for less problems. Wish for more skills. That's the reason for coming here, spending a couple of days of intense effort, taking notes, rolling up your sleeves, going to work, commit yourself to learning so that you can get smarter for the days ahead. Now here's number three. You've got to get going. All of the things that you've learned will not do you that much good if you don't put it into an action plan. Get going, that's the key. Some people are ever learning, but they don't put it into action. They don't really take the action. It's like the man who keeps bringing materials to the building site and never builds anything. He keeps bringing in the sand and the gravel and the windows and the doors and the roofing material, and he just stacks up all these supplies, but he never builds anything. So that's one of the most important things to learn, how to design your days, how to design your weeks, how to design the months so that you take the proper action to get the proper return that you're looking for, whether it's economic or personal. Get going. The disciplines is the miracle process. And here's how to get the miracle of your future going as far as disciplines are concerned. Number one, do what you can. You might go home and set a whole new pace for yourself and we call it cleaning up neglect. Should walk around the block, could walk around the block for your good health, don't walk around the block. See, you're on the wrong track. Should read, could read, don't read on the wrong track. Could change should change don't change you're on the wrong track letters you haven't written conversations you haven't had with your family somebody you should sit down with when you get back home get that job done don't let neglect destroy your days destroy your life and destroy your future go back and do what you can and if you'll do what you can then life will give you some extraordinary things to do
You've got to take care of the small disciplines before life will give you a chance to handle the more complicated disciplines. Good phrase to take home. All disciplines affect each other. It's so easy to be casual and say, well, this doesn't matter. This doesn't matter. I'm telling you, everything matters. Of course, some things matter more than others, but there isn't anything that doesn't matter. Let us not neglect. Do not neglect the small of the difference and build on that foundation and you can have everything you could possibly want. Now here's number four. You must get excited. And not just the false enthusiasm of just pure positive thinking. You've got to get excited over some very basic things. One is get excited over your ability to make yourself do the necessary things. Because discipline is major step one toward personal progress. And any time a person wishes to, they can make major changes in their life, personally and socially and financially. It doesn't ever have to be the same after today. No telling what you could do today if you really wish to. So that's number four, get excited. Get excited about your potential. Human capacity is usually never the problem. Little children can learn several languages. We can learn to do the most incredible things. All we need to do is take the time to do it. So it's not a matter of capacity. It's a matter of judgment. It's a matter of excitement. It's a matter of will. And it's a matter of wanting to bad enough. So it's pretty exciting to know that any day you wish, you can change your life. Excitement that runs deep is the excitement that really lasts for a lifetime, not surface excitement. I'll tell you what's really going to serve you well, and that's the excitement you feel inside that isn't even probably expressed on the outside. The excitement that runs deep, the excitement that stirs commitment, the excitement that stirs courage. Give me the chance and I will get the job done. That kind of excitement. Number five is get away. You've got to learn to get away. You must learn to get away and be alone. Learn to get away and reflect. Learn to get away and learn how to live as well as how to earn. How sad it would be to learn how to earn well, but not learn how to live well. You must balance your life. We teach something, especially in my staff, I teach it some, something called lifestyle. Lifestyle is how you learn to live your life. Some people have money, but they don't even know how to spend it. They have time, but they don't know how to spend it. They don't know what to do with it. They don't get joy from it, rather they get animosity. Then you've got to take time to cultivate good friends. You've got to take time to be with your family. You've got to take time to be with the people who are important to you. Get away, take the time, reflect on your life, recharge your batteries, do some growing away from your enterprise. Then when you come back to your enterprise, after you have taken this time to balance your life, you will find that on the job, working on your enterprise, things will really go much better. So those are the five simple steps to go from average to fortune. This is Jim Rohn. You're going to hear a great number of ideas as you go through the sessions on these six cassettes. Ideas that help successful people accomplish more of their goals, achieve certain wealth, and experience greater joy and satisfaction in their lives. My hope is that you'll find a few of these ideas very useful to you right now. Unfortunately, I don't know you personally. I'm not familiar with your dreams or your problems. But fortunately for you, I don't need to be, because the ideas we'll be talking about on these cassettes are fundamentals to the art of winning. They will help you achieve your most inspiring dreams, guaranteed. They are, in fact, the seven fundamentals for wealth and happiness. As we go through these cassettes, you'll see very clearly for yourself just how these ideas can start making a major difference in your life right away. Where did these fundamentals come from? I didn't make them up. I first discovered them when I was 25 years old, at a time in my life when I needed some new ideas to help change the direction of my life. I wasn't destitute at the time, but I certainly needed some help. I guess we could all use a little help at age 25. Let me take a minute to tell you how it happened. I had gotten off to a great start in life. I was raised in farm country in Idaho, a small community of about 5,000 people, not far from the Snake River in the southwest corner of the state, 
a great place to grow up. In fact, my parents still live in this small farm community. My father is 82 years old, my mother 75. And they are still healthy and doing very well, as active now as they have ever been. I'm very proud of them, and they have always been a great example for me. After graduating from high school, I went to one year of college, and then I decided I was smart enough, so I quit, which was one of my major mistakes. Among many major mistakes I made in those early days. But I was ambitious and willing to work hard, and figured I wouldn't have any trouble getting a job, which turned out to be accurate. So with a head full of dreams and ambitions, I started my first job. About three years later, I got married, made lots of promises, worked hard, and a couple of years later started a family. And at age 25, I started taking a new look at my life. My weekly paycheck amounted to the grand total of $57. I was far behind on my promises, behind on my bills, and discouraged. I was far from making the progress I thought I should have made. I was willing to work hard. That was not my problem. But it was clear that it was going to take more than hard work. And I didn't want to wind up at age 60 broke, needing assistance, like so many people I saw around me, not in the richest country in the world. So what do you do to change the direction of your life? I thought, well, I should go back to school. One year of college doesn't look that good on an application. But now with my family starting, going back to school seemed like a tough decision. I didn't have any money to start my own business. Money was one of my problems. I always had far too much month left over at the end of the money, if you've ever been in that position. I remember one time losing $10 and I was physically ill for two days over a $10 bill. Some of my friends tried to be cheerful. They said, look, maybe some poor person who needed it found it. But that was not really helpful. I must admit at that time in my life, benevolence had not yet seized me. I was the person who needed to find $10, not lose 10. So that's where I was at that time in my life, behind on my dreams, and constantly wondering what I could possibly do to change my life for the better. Well, at age 25, good fortune came my way. And many times it's difficult to explain good fortune. Why do unique things happen to you when they do? I don't know. Part of that is a mystery to me. However, my good fortune was meeting a man, a very unique and successful man. His name was Mr. Earl Schof. When I met him, I said to myself, I would give anything to be like him. I wonder what it would take. Well, to make a long story short, this very special gentleman took a liking to me. And a few months after I met him, he hired me, and I went to work for him. I spent the next five years working for him in several of his businesses, and then, unfortunately, he died. But I did get to spend five years with this remarkable man, and the best thing he gave me during that five years was not a job. The best thing he gave me was the benefit of his philosophy, the fundamentals of living successfully, how to be wealthy, how to be happy. And sure enough, his ideas worked for me. So I will always be grateful for meeting someone who made a difference in how my life worked out. I am sure if Mr. Schof were still alive, I would have called him one more time today and thanked him for sharing the ideas and inspiration that changed my life. For many years, I shared this philosophy for wealth and happiness with my business partners and met with equally exciting results. I am primarily a businessman, not a professional public speaker. But I have been intrigued with the challenge of trying to put into words the ideas that can make a difference in how a person's life works out. And now I have the chance to share these ideas with you. I don't claim to have all the answers on how to do well, but I do have some answers that have worked extremely well for me and thousands of others. Take these ideas and edit them all you wish. You certainly don't have to buy everything any one person says. But give me a chance. If something sounds good, try it. If it doesn't make sense, discard it. Remember, don't be a follower, be a student. All the ideas we'll discuss in these cassette sessions will stem from a group of very important key concepts. 
I'd like to begin this session by briefly but clearly looking at each of them. These keywords are very important for us to understand if we're to get maximum value from this program and add significantly to our wealth and happiness. The first key word is fundamentals. What a most important word, fundamentals. This word calls attention to the primary issue in our quest for greater success. It is the key word in making our lives work well. Fundamentals. Those basics that build the foundation for accomplishment, productivity, success, and lifestyle. Fundamentals form the beginning, the basis, the reality from which everything else flows. And remember, there are no new fundamentals. Fundamentals are old, well-established. Beware of someone who claims to have a new fundamental. That's like someone who claims to manufacture antiques. We would have to be suspicious, right? So fundamentals, basics, they are so very important to understand and consider and practice if you wish for the good life. And may I add here, make sure you don't go looking for the exotic answers to success. Success is a very basic process. It doesn't fall out of the sky. It doesn't have any mysteries, nor does it fall into the realm of the miraculous. Success is merely a natural result that comes from the consistent operation of the practical fundamentals. As someone wisely remarked, to be successful, you don't have to do extraordinary things. Just do ordinary things extraordinarily well. Mr. Schoff, my teacher, gave me many great phrases I'll always remember. One of them was, there are always about a half dozen things that make 80% of the difference. What a key thought, a half dozen things. Whether we are working on our health, wealth, personal goals, or professional enterprise, the difference between our ultimate success or inevitable failure lies in the degree to which we are willing to seek out, study, and to go to work on those half dozen things. For a farmer to reap a plentiful harvest in the fall, for example, the major basics are fairly obvious. Soil, seed, water, sunshine, nourishment, and care. Each fundamental being equally in need of study and attention, for together they bring about the best chance for a successful harvest. A good question to ask before undertaking any project or setting any new objective then is what are the most important half dozen things that will make the major difference in how it works out. So whether the enterprise is art or architecture, music or sculpture, mathematics or sports, business or farming, success or lifestyle, it's the fundamentals that count. To understand them and to practice them is to take the first intelligence step toward accomplishing your objectives and living your dreams. The second key word for us to consider is Wealth. Wealth is a word that brings about a wide variety of mental images. And that is part of my purpose in these cassettes, to provoke that wide variety of mental images. For that is where the dreams are. That is where the inspiration comes from. And that is where true incentive is born. The mystery and mixture of mental image. The stuff and the staff of life. Its right use, its constant use, is the way to a life unique and a life abundant. Now to one, wealth means having enough financial substance to be able to do whatever you wish to do with your life. To another, it may mean freedom from debt, freedom from the constant claim of obligation. To yet another, it means opportunity. And to many, wealth means a million dollars. That's a unique word, millionaire. It rings of success, freedom, power, Influence, pleasure, possibility, benevolence, and excitement. Not a bad mental image. Now we could talk of the wealth of experience, the wealth of friends, the wealth of love, the wealth of family, the wealth of culture. Wealth of many kinds. However, in this program, we are more specifically going to talk about wealth in the sense of financial freedom. Wealth that comes from the conversion of effort and enterprise into currency and equity. For each of us, the amount of money required to be wealthy will differ. 
But the dream for all of us, I'm sure, is the same. Freedom from financial pressure. More freedom of choice, freedom to enjoy, and the opportunity to create and to share. Wealth. The possession of great financial resources that improves the quality of your life and gives you added dignity and expanded lifestyle. So decide for yourself what wealth means to you. Latch on to your own mental image of wealth. And let's see if the ideas I'm about to bring to you will make sense and perhaps provide you with the inspiration to put the plan into high action so that as the days pass, you will discover a growing sense of freedom and dignity, self-worth, substance, and lifestyle. The next key word is happiness, the universal quest. Happiness is a joy that most often comes as a result of positive activity. Like wealth, it too has a wide variety of meanings and interpretations. Happiness is both the joy of discovery and the joy of knowing. It is a result of an awareness of the full range of life, the color, the sound, the harmony. And it is the joy that comes from designing a life and practicing the fine art of living well. Happiness is being able to explore the offerings of life by perception, response, and enjoyment. Happiness is both receiving and sharing, reaping and bestowing. It is being able to feast on harmony as well as food, on ideas as well as bread. Happiness is the deliberate act to create a wider world of experience and awareness. Happiness is having a handle on disappointment. It is being in control of both emotion and circumstance. Happiness is freedom from the negative children of fear, such as worry, low self-esteem, envy, greed, anger, resentment, and so on. Happiness is an awareness and a grasp of the positive power of life and loving values. It is an order of thought, activity, and lifestyle. Happiness is values in balance. It is contact with people of substance. Happiness is contentment with the tasks of your life. It is thought inspired by, organized with, and rooted in your personal philosophy. Happiness is a life well lived in which a wide variety of experiences are deliberately captured to become an invaluable form of currency for you to spend and invest in your own better future. Happiness is activity with purpose. It's love in practice. Happiness is both a grasp of the obvious as well as an awe of the mysterious. But for most people around us, happiness seems to be either something left behind or something yet to be discovered. Like all the good things in life, happiness is elusive by nature, but not impossible to capture. A major key for bringing joy into our lives lies in the next word we shall briefly examine. Discipline. If there is a magic word that stands out above all the rest, this is the one. Discipline. And in this program, you'll discover how positive this word is. Discipline is the bridge between thought and accomplishment, the bridge between inspiration and value achievement, the bridge between necessity and productivity. Remember, all good things are upstream. The passing of time takes us adrifting, and drifting only brings us the negative, the disastrous, the disappointment and the failure. Failure is not a cataclysmic event. It is not generally the result of one major incident, but rather a long list of accumulated little failings. Failing in life is failing to think today, failing to act today, failing to care, to strive, to climb, to learn, to keep trying day by day. If your goal requires that you write ten letters today and you write only three, you are down seven letters. If you want to make five calls and you only make one, you are down four on calls. If your plan calls for saving $10 today and you save none, you're down $10 today. Now the danger is looking at an undisciplined day and concluding that no great harm has been done. It doesn't seem like such a bad day, but add up these days to make a year and then add up those years to make a lifetime. And perhaps you can now see how repeating today's small failures can easily turn your life into a major disaster. Success, on the other hand, is just the same process in reverse. If you plan to make 10 calls 
and you end the day making 15, now you're up five calls. If you then get up a few on letters, move up the savings numbers, you can see what a massive difference it could make in a year and what wealth and accomplishment awaits for a lifetime. Discipline is like a set of magic keys that unlocks all the doors of wealth, happiness, sophistication, culture, high self-esteem, pride, joy, accomplishment, satisfaction, and success. The first key to discipline is awareness of the need for and the value of discipline, and especially the discipline to make the changes. What will it take? What must I do? And what must I become to get all I want from my life? The second key is the willingness. More than that, the eagerness to maintain your new discipline deliberately, wisely, consistently. And the third key to discipline is the commitment to master the circumstances of your daily life, to see and harness the opportunities to make something of the sun and the rain, the good as well as what comes in the guise of misfortune. Discipline does many things, but most important of all is what it does for you. It makes you feel better about yourself. Even the smallest discipline can have an incredible effect on your attitude. And the good feeling you get, that surging feeling of self-worth that comes from starting a new discipline, is almost as good as the feeling that comes from the accomplishment of the discipline. Second, a new discipline immediately alters your life direction. You don't change destinations immediately. That is yet to come. But you can change direction immediately. And direction is very important. Third, discipline cooperates with nature. Everything strives. It is a common life function. How tall will a tree grow? As tall as it can. Everything strives to become all it can possibly be. And that striving to become is what discipline is all about. Disciplining ourselves to fulfill our natural potential to become all that we can be. And finally, discipline attracts opportunity. Opportunity is always looking for ambition and skill in action. Discipline taps the unlimited power of commitment. The human will in action, driven by inspiration, enticed by desire, tempered by reason, guided by intelligence, can bring you to that high and lofty place called the good life. Discipline, those unique steps of intelligent thought and activity that put a lid on temper and a faucet on courtesy, that develop positive and control negative, that encourage success and deter failure, that design lifestyle and control frustration, that enhance health and curb sickness, that promote happiness and manage sadness. Discipline, the start and the continuing process that brings all good things, and remember, anyone can start the process. It's not if I could, I would. It's if I would, I could. If I will, I can. So start the new process. You can begin a new habit no matter how small it is. Small isn't important. Whether or not you start and whether or not you continue are all that is important. And don't be deluded by an affirmation only affirm what you are truly prepared to do. Many of us delude ourselves with our words into believing that we're making changes and making progress when in fact our daily activity is taking us in the exact opposite direction of our affirmations. Why would you walk in the opposite direction of your dreams? The man dreams of wealth and walks daily towards certain financial disaster. The man wishes for happiness and thinks the thoughts and commits the acts that take him to certain despair. So to have a prosperous life, start a prosperity plan. To become wealthy, start a wealth plan. Remember, you don't have to be wealthy to have a wealth plan. A person with no means can have a rich plan. If you are ill, start a health plan. If you don't have energy, start an energy plan. If you don't feel good, start a feel good plan. If you're not smart, start a smart plan. If you can't, start a can plan. If you haven't, start a have plan. Anyone can. Even a bad person can start hearing good messages and reading good books. Recognize that the start of the better life, the happy life, the wealthy life, 
is today. This is exciting. Both the process and the result can begin today. Start the new journey today. If you think of a new idea, today is the day to begin the discipline of putting that idea into action. Set this day up as a long, busy, exciting start for your new life. Get your first book for your new library today. Begin your new practice of setting goals today. Start clearing out a drawer of your new orderly desk today. Start eating an apple a day on your new health plan today. Put some money in your new Investment for Fortune account today. Start reading with intensity for your new Wealth of Mind plan today. Write a postponed letter today. Make a delayed telephone call today. Pick up your camera and take a picture of something to start your new treasury of photographs today. Get some momentum going on your new commitment to the better life. See how many activities you can pile on in this first day. Go all out. Break away from the negative downward pull of gravity. Start the thrusters going. Prove to yourself that waiting is over, hoping is past, and that faith and action have now taken charge. It's a new day, a new beginning for your new life. With discipline, you can't believe the list of positive moves you can make in the first day of your new beginning. What have you got to lose? Only the despair and fear and guilt of the past. Only the dissatisfaction and unhappiness and lack of fulfillment of the past. Only the frustration and low self-esteem of the past. Take great pleasure in assisting in your own new birth, no matter how successful you may already be. Now I offer you the next challenge. Make this new first day a part of the week of new beginnings. See how many things you can continue and start in this week of new beginnings. Then make it the first month of the new beginnings. Then the first year of the new beginning. By the time that first year is finished, you will never again be claimed by the past. Past habits, past influences, past regrets, or past failures. You are ready to, as the Bible phrase says, fly with the eagles. And you will have begun your certain journey toward the last key concept we'll discuss on this cassette. Success. Success is both a journey and a destination, isn't it? It is both the steady, measured progress toward a goal and the achievement of a goal. Success is an accomplishment, whether it be great or small. And it's an understanding of the potential and power of an entire human life. Success is an awareness of value, and it's the cultivation of value through discipline. It can be tangible or intangible. Success is a process of turning away from something in order to turn toward something else. From no exercise to exercise, from candy to fruit, from not investing to investing. Success is responding to an invitation, an invitation to change, to grow, to develop, to become, to move up to a better place with a better vantage point. But most of all, success is making your life what you want it to be, considering all the possibilities, considering all the examples. What do you want for your life? That is the big question. Remember, success is not a set of standards from our culture, but rather a collection of personal values clearly defined and ultimately achieved. Success is your better life for you, the design you give it, the dreams you accomplish. Making your life what you want it to be for you, that is success. All right, with that overview of some of the key concepts we'll explore in this program, let's begin the further development of your success by looking at the art of properly selecting and setting goals. I think you'll hear a couple of thoughts you've never heard before. Of all the things that changed my life for the better most quickly, it was learning how to set goals. And mastering this unique process can have a powerful effect on your life too. One morning at breakfast, shortly after I met Mr. Shelf, he asked me if he could see my current list of goals. He said, let me see your list of goals and let's go over them and talk about them. Maybe that's the best way I can help you right now. 
And I said, I don't have a list. He said, well, is it out in the car or at home somewhere? I said, no, sir. I don't have a list anywhere. He said, well, young man, that's where we better start. Then he added, if you don't have a list of your goals, I can guess your bank balance within a few hundred dollars, which he did. And that got my attention. I said, you mean that if I had a list of goals, that would change my bank balance? He said, drastically. That day I became a student of how to set goals. And sure enough, when I learned how, my whole life changed. My income, my bank account, my personality, my lifestyle, my accomplishments. So I'd like to share with you the best I have learned and practiced on goal setting. First of all, I'd like to say that we are all affected by five factors. The first is environment. The second is events. The third is knowledge. The fourth is results. And the fifth and often overlooked factor that affects our lives is our view of the future. Our dreams. I won't get into all of these influences here, but let me concentrate on the fifth one. Dreams. Of all these five influences, make sure your dreams are the greatest influence on your daily decisions and activities. Put another way, make sure that the greatest pull on you is the pull of the future. For your dreams to greatly influence you, for the future to pull you, your future must be well planned. There are two ways to face the future. One is with apprehension, the other with anticipation. Guess how many people face the future with apprehension? Why? They don't have it well designed. And without really thinking about it, they have probably bought someone else's view of how to live. You will face the future with anticipation when you have planned a future you can get excited about. When you have designed your future results in advance. In this way, the future will capture your imagination it will exert an enormous influence on you. And to design your future, you must have goals. Well-defined goals are like a magnet. They pull you in their direction. And the better you have defined them, the better you have described them, the harder you work on them, the stronger they pull. And they pull you through all kinds of difficulties too. Without goals, it is easy to let life deteriorate to the point where you're just making a living. It is not difficult to get trapped by economic necessity and settle for existence rather than substance. We all have a choice. We can either make a living or design a life. Mr. Shelf said to me, I don't think your current bank balance is a true indicator of your level of intelligence. I was happy to hear that. He said, I think you have plenty of talent and ability and that you're much smarter than your bank balance indicates. And that turned out to be true. I was much smarter. My question to him was, then why isn't my bank balance bigger? And he said, you don't have enough reasons for accomplishing great things. If you had enough reasons, you could do incredible things. You have enough intelligence, but not enough reasons. That's the key, if you had enough reasons. In my years of study, I've also discovered this. Reasons come first, and answers come second. Life has a strange way of hiding all the answers and disclosing them only to people who have been inspired to look for them, who have reasons to look for them. Put another way, when you know what you want, and you want it badly enough, you will find ways to get it. The answers, the methods, the solutions will become evident to you. Hey, what if you had to be rich? Are there any books and tapes on the subject? The answer is yes. There are plenty of good ones. But if you don't have to be rich, you probably won't read the books or listen to the tapes. What drives us to find the answers is necessity. So work on your reasons first, answer second. Now, what are some of the reasons for doing well? It varies from person to person. I'm sure that if you did a little soul searching, you could come up with a fairly strong list 
of reasons why you want to accomplish great things. There are personal reasons, sometimes uniquely personal reasons. Some people do well for the recognition. Some do well because of the way it makes them feel. They love the feeling of being a winner. That's one of the best reasons. I have some millionaire friends who keep working 10 to 12 hours a day making more millions. And it's not because they need the money. It's because of the joy, pleasure, and satisfaction that come to them from being constant winners. To them, money is not their main drive. It's not the money. It's the journey. Once in a while, someone says to me, if I had a million dollars, I'd never work another day in my life. Hey, that's probably why the good Lord sees to it that he doesn't get his million. Because he'd just quit. Family is another reason or motivator for doing well. Some people do extremely well because of other people. And that's a powerful reason. Sometimes we will do things for someone else that we would not do for ourselves. We are made that way. I met a man who once said to me, Mr. Rohn, to do everything I want to do around the world with my family, I need at least a quarter of a million dollars a year. I thought, incredible. Could a man's family affect him that much? And the answer is, of course. How fortunate are the people who find themselves greatly affected by someone else. It's powerful. Benevolence, the desire to share, can be a powerful reason for wanting to achieve. Some people do extremely well gathering up resources, so they can then be benefactors. When Andrew Carnegie, the great steel magnet, died, his desk was opened, and in one of the desk drawers was found a slip of paper. On that slip of paper, Mr. Carnegie had written his goal for his life, and he wrote it when he was in his 20s. On that slip of paper, he had written, I'm going to spend the first half of my life accumulating money. I'm going to spend the last half of my life giving it all away. That's terrific. He was so inspired by that goal that during the first half of his life, he accumulated $450 million. And during the last half of his life, he gave it all away. How powerful. What has you turned on? What has you getting up early, hitting it hard all day and staying up late? What has you inspired? Next question, what's got you turned off? When I found the answers to those two questions, my life exploded into change. I finally found out what negative philosophy of life I had allowed to limit me and had me turned off, and I got that cured. Then I found a long enough list of reasons to turn me on, and once the lights went on for me at age 25, they have never gone out. I've fallen out of the sky a few times, but I've never lost that drive to do something unique with my life. Now there's another list of reasons for doing well called nitty gritty. Those hard little reasons that can really affect your life. Sometimes it doesn't take much of a goal to start you in a brand new life direction. I now carry a few hundred dollars in my money clip. It's only a few hundred dollars. But the story behind why I do it reveals one of those reasons that greatly affected me. Just before I met Mr. Schoff, I heard a knock at my door one day. When I opened it, there was a little girl selling Girl Scout cookies. And she gave me one of the finest sales presentations I've ever heard. A special deal, several flavors, and only $2. Back when you could get a lot for $2. And with a big smile, she very politely asked me to buy. And I wanted to. Big problem. I didn't have $2. And to this day, I can still clearly remember the pain and the embarrassment. I was a father. I had been to college. I was working. And I didn't have $2. Now, since I didn't want to tell her that, I did what I thought was next best. I lied to her. I said, hey, I've already bought lots of Girl Scout cookies. 
I've still got plenty stacked in the house. Now that wasn't true, but it seemed to get me off the hook for the moment. She said, that's wonderful, sir. Thank you very much. And she went away. After she had left, I closed the door and that was the day I said, I don't want to live like this anymore. I've had it with being broke and I've had it with lying. I've had it with being embarrassed over not having any money in my pocket. I promised myself that day that this would never happen again. I picked a day and an amount and I said, I'll never carry less. It was one of those reasons that still affects my life after all these years. So I now carry a few hundred dollars in my money clip. I do that for two reasons, I guess. One reason is the way it makes me feel. That special feeling of having plenty. Mr. Shove said to me, the first $500 you earn, put into your pocket, not in the bank. It feels much better in your pocket than it does in the bank. I've found that's true. But I also carry plenty in case I bump into another Girl Scout who's selling cookies. I'm ready. I remember walking out of the bank one day in Northern California where I lived at the time, and there were two little girls selling candy right outside the bank for some girl's organization. The first little girl walked up to me and said, Mister, would you like to buy some candy? I said, I probably would. What kind is it? She said, it's Almond Roca. I said, that's my favorite. She said, wonderful. I asked, how much is it? She said, it's only $2. I thought, it couldn't be still $2 after all these years. I couldn't help remembering the Girl Scout and the cookies. I said, how many boxes of that candy have you got? She said, I've got five. And the other little girl standing there, she was selling candy too. I asked, how many boxes do you have? She said, I've got four. I said, that's nine. I'll take them all. They said, really? I said, yes, I've got some friends, so I'll pass them around. They got so excited, put all this candy together. I reached into my pocket and gave them $18. Now, when I've got the candy and they've got the money, that first little girl looks up and says, Mister, you are really something. How about that? Can you imagine only spending $18? and having someone look at you in the face and say, you are really something. Now you know why I carry heavy. I'm not going to miss those chances anymore. It was a small goal, just a few hundred dollars, but it had a big effect on my life. I have a dear friend, Robert DePew. Bobby used to be a school teacher in Lindsay, California, the olive capital. After he taught school for several years, he became a little weary of teaching and decided to get into sales. One day, without telling anyone, he quit his teaching job and jumped into sales. When he did, his brother poked fun at him. His brother said, you're going to go right down the drain. You had a good teaching job. Now you're going to lose everything you have. You must be out of your mind. He put him down something fierce. Bobby said, the way my brother acted made me so angry. I decided to get rich. Today, Robert happens to be one of my millionaire friends. The attainment of wealth is not just a matter of intelligence. Mostly, it's a matter of inspiration. So if you have strong enough inspiration, a strong enough reason, large or small, it can have an incredible influence on the direction.